Welcome to Senate Education, Wednesday, February 1st, 1.33 p.m. We're going to start by having a conversation around teaching salaries here in Vermont, just so we understand uh, where things stand, what sorts of things the legislature may or may not want to do. But the overarching issue that we're looking at is a massive teacher shortage in the state of Vermont. Uh, across the country. How can we be competitive? What is com you know, being competitive look like? Looks like, look like. Uh, a lot of these, all of these things are made by local school boards, etc. I think it's just important for us to, to have the conversation and then just ask ourselves as a state, should we set a minimum salary for teachers? I, I guess it'll be interesting to me personally just to see where people are and what they think um, and just kind of help us all understand that. We're then going to continue our conversations around universal meals. We're going to hear from uh, then the deans of uh, University of Vermont and Castleton on teacher education and then return to Teach in Vermont campaign with Merrigan Cargill who will give us a sense of you know, how are we helping our teachers with their debt. Uh, but to kick us off, Ms. Julia Richter, uh, fiscal analyst for Joint Fiscal, who has a, does great work for all of us, and we're grateful that you're here, and grateful to you for taking the time to put together this presentation. So with that, Ms. Richter, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's nice to be in the committee. I think this is my first time testifying in person this year to you all. So I'm Julia Richter with the Joint Fiscal Office. I'm a fiscal analyst. I focus on the education fund primarily. So I was asked to come in here to talk about teacher salaries in Vermont. Um, and so my, my presentation is really sort of two parts. The first is to just think about the mechanics of the education fund. Where do teacher salaries fall in the education fund? And then the second is to get a little bit more into understanding comparisons of teacher salaries both within Vermont and then within the Northeast and the nation as a whole. Did you want me to share my slide deck? Too? I would like you to, if you would. Sure. Mind. And Scott or Hayden can give you access to uh, the big screen. Sure. Yeah, Hayden did share the Zoom link right. with me ahead of time, so I'm just going to log in. Thank you. Um, for people watching at home, there is a presentation that you can download that is available under my name on the committee page. It does say, please wait for the host to start the meeting. Um, Hayden, is that something you can uh, you can do? Yeah, let me try and troubleshoot right now. Okay. Should I just get started, or? Why don't you get started? Okay. Thanks. So I'm starting out. I do see that that the committee has the the slide deck in front of them. So I am on page two now, and just thinking about the mechanics of the education fund. I know that Brad James from AOE came and. Um, talk to you all about the education fund and how that works. So, um, Hayden's just letting me in right now so I can pull up my slides. Okay. All right, so, here we are on slide two. So yeah, so Brad talked to you, walked you through the education fund and how that works. Um, and you'll recall that each school budget, each school district builds an annual budget, right? And that requires local voters approval. And we can think about that local budget. Big picture is having sort of two primary parts. It's got the offsetting revenue. So that includes things like categorical aid. So specific aid coming from the state of Vermont or the federal government, tuition revenues, other things like that. And then it also has the other part, which is education spending. And education spending is really one of those factors that is used to adjust the local property taxes. Education spending for equalized pupil, you hear a lot about, um, because that is the, the state the, the local determined factor of, of how property taxes are adjusted in correspondence with the, the statewide yield. So unless funded by categorical aid or federal funding, personnel salaries, including teachers, 
fall into that district's education spending in Vermont. So as I mentioned, that education spending per equalized pupil ultimately drives adjustments to the local homestead property tax rates. So I've got this all else equal here because we've got the education fund and all these things coming and going. When we're looking at changing one thing, it's helpful to think, okay, if nothing else were to change, how would one specific change be reflected within the education fund? So if all else is equal, um, increases to teacher salaries would be borne by property taxes, right? Because that's, that's that, that adjustment that's used to make up the difference. Um, and in a single school district, if a single school district increases its teacher salaries, its homestead property tax rate will increase accordingly, all of its equal. So that's sort of big picture mechanics of the education fund. I'll pause there if there's any questions about that before moving into comparisons. I don't see. Okay. So I do want to just raise a couple of considerations when comparing and analyzing teacher salaries. Um, I pulled some data from AOE from 20 and FY20 and 21 and looked at average teacher salaries in Vermont across all position, all categories, like pre-K teacher, special education teacher, elementary school teacher, and I looked at what the average salary was for those different positions. And we see there's a range of about 55,500 for one category of teacher at the lowest end of the range up to an average in the highest teacher category of 78,300. Senator Hashim. Um, just a quick question. I'm curious how uh, these, the salary range compares to other people in Vermont. And do you happen to know what the median income is in Vermont in general? I don't have that number. I can certainly get it back, get okay. back to you again. Great. Thank yeah, you. sure. Senator Gould. And category is not based on geography or anything like that, strictly a difference in job. Correct. Okay. So I was aware of the committee's limited time capacity. So for the um, for the, the range of I I decided I could have also looked at geographies, I thought to look at, you know. Pre-K teacher versus a special education teacher. Or yeah. Elementary oh, school. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there are, as you mentioned, Senator, a number of reasons why salaries may vary. It could be position, location, bargaining agreement, experience, education level. I'm sure that uh, the stakeholders are much better to speak to that than than I am. But it's something to keep in mind that variance of salaries. May I just interrupt? Also, <clears throat> is there any guidance out there in statute that says of teacher that gives school board members and negotiators some kind of guidelines for to follow. Five-year teachers should be at least making this. Is there anything in statute now around those kinds of guidelines that you're aware of? I'm not aware of anything, okay. but I would defer to my Happy to ledge talk. council yeah. counterpart, Beth, yeah. who would be so, able to speak to that. Yeah. Um, and then the other... <coughs> The other thing that I also, in terms of considerations that I did want to raise, is salary doesn't necessarily capture all compensation of an employee, mm -hmm. right? So teachers also receive non-salary benefits like pensions and health care. So AOE also publishes data that in addition to the salaries includes benefits. benefits. Um, so I, I did the same exercise that I did with salaries and I looked at, okay, what is the average across all, all teachers? including salary and benefits, and that was about 80,000. And then what is that range? And that ranged from 71,900 through 101,000. Um, so just keeping that in mind that salary is one metric when examining compensation yep. of, a, of, a, of a teacher or a personnel, but it's not necessarily the only metric um, for looking at compensation. Good point. And Senators, uh, I think it's tomorrow and the next day we are getting Pension 101, just so everybody gets a sense of what things are about. Okay, so, yeah. great. Um, and so then, so then keeping these in mind, I was asked to come in and talk about salaries. So I pulled from um, the National Education Association. They publish uh, data that compares the average salary across the United States by state. Um, and so, yeah. So 
this is before adjusting for cost of living. So we have to keep in mind that, you know, living in Vermont versus living in Louisiana or California, salaries, compensation might not go as far in different places. So this is before adjusting for that cost of living. So when we've got those numbers in front of us, we see that Vermont has the 19th highest average teacher salary nationally and the third lowest in the Northeast. And I do want to include that caveat that this salary comparison doesn't include those benefits that I just spoke about. Senator Blue. Um, are there any? I don't. Tomorrow. Okay. But I think Scott will get some. Okay. Great. Uh, here he comes. If anyone would like a mask, uh, Mr. Moore has them. Ms. Richter, please. Okay. Um, so that's just to help us understand Vermont in the context of the nation, but this doesn't adjust for cost of living. So then, as in a trained economist, I think, okay, well, we really should be also looking at the cost of living um, when comparing salaries, because that's another way to inform. So the cost of basic needs, like food, childcare, everything that I know you're all well aware of, they vary by state. Um, and so one way that you can compare salaries is using, you know, the, the living wage in each state. And, and MIT publishes a living wage calculator, which uses the same methodology to calculate the living wage in each state. So it, it's, it, it provides a helpful benchmark for us to think about how we can, can compare salaries. So I compared, so I applied the living wage um, benchmark against all of the average salaries that we had published that I just I just presented in the previous slide. Um, ooh, looks as though my slide deck just went out on me. Um, but I'm on slide six now. Okay. And I'm going to just reshare my screen. I'm trying to go through. I don't want to take into anyone else's time. You're fine. We're, we're, we're good. Okay. Um, can you all see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, so I was just talking about adjusting for cost of living. And so then I took the same, the same numbers that we were just looking at um, published by NEA that are the average salaries across the country. And then I said, okay, well, what if we compare for cost of living? And I didn't include any average salaries or wages on this page because that would be kind of like comparing apples to oranges. It would be difficult to interpret. So instead, I just included the ranks. So where does Vermont rank within the nation? And where do other Northeast states rank within the nation? And then also, where um, does Vermont rank within the Northeast? So as we, we saw those rankings here in slide four, <laughs> We saw that one means that they had the highest, New York had the highest average teacher salary in the country, right? Mm -hmm. 51 would be the lowest average teacher salary in the country. So when we come to the adjustment of cost of living, we see that Vermont has, after adjusting, the 24th highest average teacher salary nationally, and then the sixth lowest in the Northeast. Um, and once again, this is the same caveat that the salary comparison doesn't include benefits or pensions or, or any of those other compensation. That wraps up my prepared remarks, but I'm happy. Senator Reeds. <clears throat> uh, just curiosity. So from your research, uh, did you ever touch on are the pensions kind of uh, in somewhat equilibrium between states, that they're, they're kind of the same? That's an, scale. that's an excellent question. I don't know. Yeah, I would have to touch expert. base with Chris Root. Know. He's really the pension okay, expert. Yeah. If you had touched it. No. Hmm. Any questions? Yes, Senator Banks. <clears throat> so have you seen any indication that when one school district raises the wages of the teachers that there's a cascading effect that others do that? That's a that's an excellent question. Um, I don't I don't feel that I could speak to those school districts' decisions. I would defer to the, the the people on the ground who are seeing how those school districts are making decisions. Yeah, just sort of again thumbnail sketch. Mm -hmm. If if 
if Vermont uh, cost of living was like say pegged at one, mm -hmm. uh, how how does that relate to that New York? Like how how you know cost of living uh, factor uh, you know significantly? You know, can you? Yes, yeah, certainly. I know you use in your formula. You must have used a factor. I'm wondering, like sure. how different. Yeah. So that's a great. Um, that's a great question. I would say so. The living wage. If there is a hot link, if you do go onto the website, you can play with the calculator. Um, but essentially, what the living wage is is it says okay to support you know one adult with no children. This is the hourly rate that this hourly wage that a wage earner would need to make. And then two adults or with two children, and so I pulled from the from the li living wage calculator, all using the same assumptions, and then I divided that by the average salary to okay. figure out how that broke up. Okay. Um, and I will say I um, I don't do this personally, but it, our office JFO publishes a basic needs budget and a living wage report. Um, so thinking about living wage um, and what it do can or cannot capture is certainly something that, that JFO has, has thought about and, and worked on. So, so the teacher's um, pension, is that all, is that they're considered state employees? They're, are they all on the same pension schedule? I don't want to speak with Certainty. There are pension costs that are coming out of the education fund. Oh, pension. I think it's tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> but Mr. Robinson from the NEA is behind you. Mr. Robinson, would you just uh, mind responding to that question? Sure. First, right. being are our teachers <clears throat> part of? Are they state employees? Uh, yes. And then. <clears throat> yeah. So for the record, Tom Robinson, Vermont NEA. There are three pension systems in Vermont. There's the state employees pension system the municipal employees pension system, the teacher's pension system. There are three separate funds. Um, the licensed teachers, including teachers, principals, and superintendents are in the teacher system. Um, school support staff, unlicensed school employees are in the municipal pension system. And- So paraeducators? Correct. Okay. Are in the municipal <clears throat> pension system. And then state employees are in the state system. As uh, Julia mentioned, there are portions of the cost for the state um, teacher's retirement system that come out of the education fund and she can speak clearly about what that looks like, I'm sure, uh, at a point if needed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Richter, this might be a question for the Lake Council, but uh, do you know if any other states set a minimum salary for teachers? I don't know. I would need to look into it. I know that there are conversations that are happening at the federal level, um, but I haven't looked into that in, in more detail. And I guess the other question would be, and this might be something we get, might hear from our other witnesses, is there something for the state employees where they are you know, tagged at a certain level, therefore they come in at this salary and then automatically in five years, automatically in 10 years, those kinds of increment. Like a, a wage step structure yeah, something or like something. That. Yeah. I would need to get back to you on, on how that how that works at the state level. Would you mind doing that? Sure. Yeah, it could even be by email. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, Senator Skulik, everybody okay? So this, you know, it, it's helpful it, it, as we jump into this uh, and understanding, you know, what it's like to be a teacher. It's, it's really helpful for us to understand what salaries look like, what the competition looks like, and um, and like I said, we'll be digging into this with other witnesses. Uh, do you know the lowest teaching salary in Vermont? I do not. Okay, I think Mr. Robinson may be able to share that with us. So, thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Yes, Mr. Wayne. Can I get an hour one? Um, yeah. Trying to, let me re rephrase it in my mind before I ask it. Um, the the teachers' health care, do they go through the same system as VLCT for the municipalities? They don't. Okay. All right. The reason I ask that is yeah. because 
at the local level, part of the, the municipalities, you know, figuring the wages of their employees, they all, they, they, have, they take their health care costs into effect. And yeah. even though they're not making a lot of money per hour, yeah. when, you, when you factor in the pension, or the actual pension contributions and, and the uh, health benefits, that's significant. So yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to compare we're different, we have different systems. Yeah, no, you're, you're asking the right question, it's for sure. And I thought that one slide in particular was helpful to kind of look at it from the pension health, you know, issue, you know, as a, as a compensation package, if you will. I mean, if it's yeah. a good compensation package, it might make us number one. Might, yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Richter, this was a lot of work. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm happy to. I'll stay in the room in case there's any other. That would be questions. great, thank you. Uh, the order I have is Francis Nichols, Tinney, Robinson, you're not even up here, but whatever order you guys all want to go. Robinson Colin, first. Yeah. Colin, you're up. School meal. No, you jumped to the school meals. Yes. Oh, you're right. God, Colin, thank you. About time someone called me. I'm not allowed to get away with Happy some Happy like shenanigans. Uh, okay, <clears throat> this is for Mr. Robinson. Yeah. Don't worry, oh, don't wow. late. Printed. Don't worry. Yeah, I know it was Jeez. emailed last minute, but we got it printed. Appreciate yeah. it. Uh, I, I did not need it printed, but I appreciate it. Yeah. Wonderful. Mr. Uh, Robinson, great. Thank you. So for the record, Colin Robinson, Vermont NEA, and really appreciate the conversation, the topic. Um, I want to sort of speak to the crux of the conversation first, but some of the other questions yeah. that have come up today, I'd be happy to speak to as well. And I should make it clear, this is my pet question. Yeah. This has been on my yep. mind, teacher salaries, workforce development kinds of things. So uh, I just want to make sure that everybody, uh, yeah. Absolutely. One of the powers of being a chair may have. Absolutely. The only Absolutely. <laughs> right. It's good, it's an important yeah, right. conversation. Yeah, right. So I want to start with a little bit of context and the report, feel free to peruse it at your leisure, but by painting out the education workforce, and I'm going to talk about both teachers as well as school support staff, because I think for many of the reasons that you've heard, we, we need to be having a conversation about both segments of our education workforce. I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anybody. It's a female dominated workforce. 75% of teachers are female. Um, over 80% of school support staff are female. It's a highly educated workforce. Um, according to the 2018 report that you have in front of you, um, about three quarters of teachers either have master's degrees or are pursuing master's degrees. In Vermont. In Vermont, yep, this is Vermont. Yep. And actually nearly 50% of paraeducators in Vermont have bachelor's degrees. Um, so, you know, this is a highly educated workforce. As you um, just heard, um, oh, actually, they are compared to other peers with similar education levels um, in Vermont, teachers are paid 86 cents on the dollar. So compared to other professionals with master's degrees, you get 86 cents on the dollar. Um, you heard from Julie's testimony, some information. The link is also referenced in my testimony to this national salary database that she utilized. But I think the key points there are that Vermont is really at kind of in the middle of the pack um, when it comes to whether you're talking about average salary, but also starting salary. We ranked 26 in the country with a starting average starting salary of about 40, just over 40,000. Um, for with the lowest starting salary in the 2021-2022 school year, um, being one SU or SD that had a starting teacher salary of um, $36,975. So that would be somebody coming in right out of school with no experience. If you aren't familiar with educator salary schedules, specifically on the teacher side, there's a whole schedule that overlays with years of experience and levels of education that folks move along as they advance in their career to reflect their years of service as well as their educational attainment. And is that like a statewide policy that everyone has to follow? No, so which brings me to okay. um, kind of a final point. We have local collective bargaining in Vermont, yeah. right? We have local control, but 
at its base, collective bargaining is an arrangement between and a conversation and negotiation ultimately between one's employer and employees, right? And in the in Vermont's education system, we have, as we know, multiple school districts or supervisory districts and unions, and those are who the local teachers and school support staff negotiate with. So to that end, there are, um, we have 72 local associations across the state, and each of those local associations, many of them are comprised of a support staff unit, because there is a separate bargaining unit from teachers, and they locally negotiate with their school boards over the terms and conditions of employment, including salaries and the salary schedules. Um, I mentioned school support staff. We're 29th in the country in terms of our uh, support staff wage annualized. I didn't do all the really great sort of additional calculations that Julia did for inflationary um, or cost of living adjustments and the stuff and the like. I also just by way of reference on the education workforce, just generally, I think we know that the challenges the education workforce is facing predated the pandemic. Yeah. And also as a point of information, um, there's been a 50% decline in people pursuing degrees in education what since 50% okay. over the past 15 years. So there are 50% fewer people entering programs in colleges and universities to become teachers. Senator Hashim. Um, so I have a question that I think is related to what you just yeah. described. Um, I'm curious as to how much you think it's related to pay versus how much it's related to the work environment and the challenges with going into teaching because um, as it relates to the declining number of folks who are going into this and I mean, you know, I lived with a teacher for a number of years yeah. and just watching the amount of work that yeah. she did after hours yeah. and on the weekend and during the summer, I'm just like, man, it's, it's incredible. So yeah, is it, yeah, what's, what are your thoughts on pay versus work environment? I think it's a totality of all of it. I don't think it's any one. Um, and I think what essentially you're describing are kind of the working conditions. What we hear from our members is yes and, yeah. right? It's compensation as well as all the things that you've heard collectively as well as what you're de describing, Senator. Um, and so I think that creates a confluence of events that for folks who might be thinking about pursuing a career in education are like, okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not, or maybe I'll pursue something that is, is perhaps a little different. I don't think it's any one. And to that end, I don't think that there is any single solution to how we build up our education workforce going forward. I think compensation should be a component. Vermont ADA believes compensation should be a component of that. Um, but by no means is it the totality of, of uh, the solution. Senator Weeks. Just out of curiosity, just to really understand the numbers, are, yeah. is the shift towards paraeducators a uh, strategic decision on the part of uh, school uh, districts and such, or is it a reaction to the lack of uh, teachers coming to the pipeline? Um, I will, I, I think it would be great to hear from my colleagues from the principal and superintendents association since they're the ones who make personnel decisions. Um, I do think as a general matter, school support staff and specifically paraeducators have provided a central role in our education system for a very, very long time. And I don't know that there's been a distinct shift one way or another. Okay, that's fair. Um, I do think that their student needs have become more complex. And one of the ways to ensure that students are able to access their learning is by making sure that there are um, folks like paraeducators, behavioral interventionists in the school environment to assist and support those students being able to access their learning so the teachers can provide the instruction that the students need and are, are, are there to get. Um, and I, they might be able to provide some additional context for, for your question. Okay. Um, so, to that end, where do we go? I am really appreciative of this conversation, and I think that uh, to Senator Campion's question earlier, there are some states that have gone the direction of kind of statutory minimum salaries. So in statute, it says, in state statute, it says, no teacher shall make less than X. Um, 
I will say there is a, I would say, a tension and potentially conflict in Vermont with that because we have local control and we have local collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. And so what you see in my testimony is there are some states that have gone this direction. You'll see states like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, they have strong collective bargaining laws. Their statutory minimums are $18,000. I guarantee you there are no teachers in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and New Jersey yeah. who are making that, assuming they're not some part of a full time, you know, maybe yeah. they're quarter percent or 10th of a percent of an FBE. Um, some other states have more robust salary numbers in statute because they're not collective bargaining states, right? So they have a different way of compensating teachers through non-contractual arrangements that are set in statute. Now recognizing we can, and historically in Vermont, have set goals for our local districts to work towards most recently in the context of merging governance structures in Act 46. The legislature in passing Act 46 set out some specific metrics for districts to follow to attain um, governance consolidation and other educational quality points and to incentivize local decision makers, local school boards and communities to make those decisions, they provided some tax benefits. So, um, in conversations this fall with Representative Catherine Sims from the Northeast Kingdom, recognizing that how do we sort of rectify this sort of tension, perhaps, with a desire to state a goal while recognizing local communities and uh, local boards and local unions need to have the ability to make decisions and come to agreement locally, could we honor that local control and local collective bargaining by setting out some statutory goals for bargaining, a minimum salary of 50,000 for teachers, a minimum wage of school support staff of 20,000, that would then create, uh, if certain districts, and as constructed in the conversations with Representative Sims, it would be specifically tailored towards districts that have um, high poverty rates and rurality or sparsity that align with the new weights that are being implemented in fiscal years 20, beginning in fiscal years 25. So this concept that we're still working on, I really wanna thank Julia for helping um, Representative Sims think, think that through, is that for fiscal years 25, 26, and 27, the, if the two parties, the district and the educators at a local level, through the normal collective bargaining processes, attain these minimum salary benchmarks in those targeted districts, poverty, rurality, then they would be able to take a portion of the cost attributed to that salary increase and remove it from their local education spending calculation for taxing purposes. You remember at the beginning of Julia's presentation, she talked about kind of how things are sort of calculated in education spending. So by creating a local exemption from education spending for a portion of that salary increase, it can create an additional incentive for the two parties potentially to achieve these minimum goals. So that's sort of a construct that we're working on right now and, and it's still in the formative stages, although I think we're getting closer to, um, I think hopefully having something of substance that, that folks can sink their teeth into. Senator Williams. Does the Vermont NEA have a strategic plan that covers anything you just said? You got, you got to put through some dates out there. So we have a legislative agenda that incorporates a desire to move towards uh, these sort of minimum thresholds through a construct like I articulated. Is it on your web page? Yeah, okay. and I believe it was shared with the committee when my when our executive director Jeff Fannin testified back in January. Yeah, yeah, we can get you a, another. You, yeah. those are happy. Days. To, yep. It was like yeah, it of course, was flying at yep. us. Yep. So I'm still getting. There's a ton of information yeah, there. I wouldn't okay. expect you to yeah. read through the 10 pages yeah. of things yeah. that were. Yeah. Yeah. So the other associations, they, do they have input into that plan? Or? Uh, well, I would say our legislative agenda is ours, just like their sure. associations have theirs. But obviously, public policy conversations about things like we're here today are everybody's going to engage, and I'm, I'm sure in so much as they desire to and would fully okay. support and expect them to. Yeah. You know. Senator Blewett. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, 
thank you, Colin. Uh, I'm um, wondering this potential legislation that might be coming our way, is there any kind of a precedent for that? I, it sounds really innovative in some ways. Uh, the, I think the precedent- Act 46 in a way. Act 46. So yeah. I'll, I'm gonna go under the hood here real quick uh, of this. <laughs> and um, the original construct that Representative Sims and I talked about was a direct reflection of Act 46, which was, for folks who might not know, was a a penny rate reduction over a phased in period that went from, I think at its peak, either eight or 10 cents down to two cents that gradually waned. In further conversations with uh, JFO, it became clear that, especially with implementing the new weights, that particular construct could create some challenges in calculations. And so it moved to this conversation about uh, exempting a percentage of the increase from the local ed education spending, which then, because of how our education tax are calculated, would have a, a positive or an incentivizing effect on the local tax rates. Yes, Senator Roots? Uh, maybe a premature question, but I'm curious if has there been any analysis done that if a if you set a minimum wage or minimum salary, uh, teacher salary at 50000 that the second order effect of the other teachers uh, requesting uh, bumps, uh, salary bumps, and what that does to the overall cost of uh, teaching? Yeah. Uh, so, good question. And as a general matter, you know, as I sort of described, you have these uh, in local collective bargaining agreements, you have on the teacher side, as well as on the uh, the um, non-licensed educator side, you have a salary schedule and usually the base does impact other parts of the salary schedule. So your question is an, <coughs> the correct and intuitive one, the specific impacts that it would have would be part of local collective bargaining for the two parties to figure right. out what that would have. But might there be a financial model that, that you know, based on experience that if you drive minimum, you know, federal minimum wage, and if you drive up minimum wage, and then that affects, you know, that ripple effects goes across the spectrum of employees. Ms. Rector? Yeah, Julie Rector, JFL. I think that wage you're talking about is way too compression, and it's certainly something that has been looked into um, by people studying minimum wage for a number of different sectors, federally, state level. With respect to a specific model, I would need to do a bit more research. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, not, not, it's not an ask. It's just when this, if this becomes live, you know, it's, it's, it's not just the immediate effect. It's the yeah. second and third order. You know, yeah. Impacts. And for what it's worth, I, I think if we were to ever move in this direction, we definitely would have to really dig in and look at what the long, what the implications would be. And I think it's a good point. I mean, we talked about this all the time with minimum wage. If you raise somebody's salary to 15 an hour and they've been making 10, what about the guy or gal that's making 15? You know, what does that look like going forward? And what, what would those costs be? Yeah, and I think those are all absolutely fair questions um, worth exploration. I think some of the um, information that was provided by Joint Fiscal really points to kind of where we are in the context of the Northeast, mm -hmm. where we are in the context of the nation in terms of these salaries. Yeah. And so understanding that there perhaps is a tension between those two. And if we're talking about attracting and retaining high quality educators, in particular in this context, we're talking about trying to do it in some of our um, ruralist, r most rural, and uh, uh, highest poverty communities. Um, because this, as currently constructed, wouldn't necessarily be, ex it, it shouldn't be accessible to some of the places where you think of educator compensation already being some of the highest in the state, right? This is an attempt to kind of level level up. The one little final note. Uh, then, let me just have yeah. Mr. Weeks jump in, uh, Senator Weeks. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, so just to, uh, since you offered it in your, in your data yeah. sheet, your, your uh, summary, Maine stands out, uh, it's kind of an anomaly. It's got a very high minimum. Yep. Uh, okay, but ranks uh, uh, quite low in, uh, in its national average. It seems counterintuitive. I'm wondering what the experience is there, that they drove it so high, but they're yeah. still, it's not 
it didn't have the, the resulting effect. Yeah. So a great again, great question. Uh, it just it just went to oh, forty. Oh, it just went. Okay. It just went to oh, 40. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this just happened. I yeah. believe. Don't quote me on the whether it was six months ago or eighteen months ago. I don't know exactly, but it was in a very recent period of time when we're talking about being able to see these um, yeah. long-term impacts on on data. Ms. Richter, do you have something, not that you've done it, but is there something out there that you could provide Senator Weeks and the rest of the committee with just around salary increases, minimum wage, what that would look like, you know, in a different, what it's looked like in a different state, some kind, something that you've already done for the legislature, or is there something out there that just could help us start to get our heads around it? I will definitely talk to my colleagues at JFO. Okay. I don't work as much on minimum wage, just be so I'll, yeah. I'll touch base with a couple of our other analysts and see what we've got okay, thank floating you. around and, and can touch base with you thank about you. that, definitely. My only final point, and then I, I would um, gladly yield, yield my time from here on out. Um, some of you might be familiar with former Representative Maida Townsend. She just, she didn't run for re-election this year, but long time legislator. And she actually was Vermont A president back in the 1980s. And um, during the 80s, she, to your point about sort of a strategic plan, in the 1980s, um, there was a campaign that she helped lead our members through as the president of our board called the Up From 51st campaign. Because in the 1980s, huh. Vermont's teachers were 51st in the nation. So, uh, you know, we've obviously made a lot of progress since, since that time. Um, and but at the same time we're still still sort of in the middle of the pack as, as we saw but it's kind of an interesting little historical note good progress yeah yeah that, yeah yeah. 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 yeah yeah thank you great thank you all very much for taking the time and yeah mr nichols good afternoon good jay afternoon. nichols executive director of the vermont principals association for the record a um, couple quick things uh, related to what Colin said, and then I'll share any other testimony I have. Um, so any weakening of our, our pension system, I think, would really hurt us in terms of retaining teachers. Um, Senator Weeks asked a question, I believe, about the pension system. A few years ago, uh, maybe it was last year, we had the talk about a uh, plan that the treasurer had uh, that was supported by the House and didn't end up going anywhere in the end. Yeah. And that pension plan, we actually had it shared with uh, folks, uh, <coughs> government relations folks at the National Association of Elementary and Secondary School Principals. And they said we would have the fifth worst pension in the United States had we implemented that. Now, we didn't implement it. We made some changes to it. I'm not sure exactly where we stack up now, but it's certainly better than fifth. So it's something to, to consider because all the states around us have a better pension system or as good as ours, and they all were gonna have a lot better than ours had we gone to the, the draconian uh, plan that was put forward with be no, no raises for cost of living or anything like that for people that retired from now going forward. So that, that did get shuttered down. So that was the House proposal? That was House proposal last year. Oh, it was actually, it came from the Treasurer, I think, originally. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and Colin can talk more about that probably, but I, want, I just wanna mention that. The second thing related to Colin's testimony, he mentioned, um, number of people coming into the field. I gave you uh, some stats on teacher teachers before coming in, if I remember right. Yep. It was around 176,000 people were coming into the teaching field, into the colleges of education across the country each year, and now it's somewhere down around 86,000. Yep. Those are off the top of my head, but I gave you the actual numbers right. and testimony a week or so ago. I just wanted to share that. Uh, so for us, on the minimum teacher pay, um, First of all, I put a link in here to federal legislation that someone is putting forward that would give teachers a base teacher salary of $60,000. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but it's federal legislation. We would prefer to see something come from, from the feds with some uh, feds, federal support to pay for something like that work to come uh, to fruition, but I put that link in there so you could read that article in Education Week. And I did mention I've discussed with this committee for my increasing concerns about the pipeline nationally and more specifically in Vermont. And an increase in base teacher pay certainly would be helpful in attracting people to the profession and retaining some of our newer educators who I think are woefully underpaid. And that's true for parents too. Uh, I'm so supportive of parents that I married a parent educator. That's how supportive I am. That's pretty supportive. That's pretty supportive. <laughs> that's pretty supportive. <laughs> <laughs> However, the, the how we as a state would go about this without federal financial support concerns me even more than the what at this point. So 
some of the questions I think that the General Assembly needs to consider. Where will the funds come from? Mm -hmm. If they're just added on to local budgets, it's going to increase the likelihood that budgets will be voted down. Mm -hmm. And this will especially impact the least resource community, uh, communities, which always worries me. Yep. Uh, will local school districts be pressured to reduce services to students in other areas if they have to contend with increased teacher salaries? And is there some type of new revenue source that would be considered? And some thoughts, this wouldn't be the most popular one, but uh, maybe it's time to consider a statewide teacher's contract negotiation, negotiating process on salary as we already do in healthcare. Maybe build in regional indexes that correspond with the cost of living in a given area. I know this flies in the face of local control, but with a statewide education funding system, which is what we have right now, maybe it's time we take a serious look at this. I also just did five minutes on, on Google, and I went to Hawaii, and I found out their statewide teacher's contract. It's 108 pages long for the whole state, for every teacher in the state. Burlington's is 80 pages long for one school district. I thought that was a little bit uh, yeah. illustrative. We don't have anybody here from Burlington. So, yeah, so I just, well, I thought I would share that. Yeah, so no, I, uh, I think Burlington's is probably the longest, so that's why I picked on them. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's longer ones, but that's a pretty long one. And I think that any program that is designed should have a gradual implementation so it's not to shock the system any more than necessary. And just want to finish by saying, and take any questions you have, we agree that starting teachers are underpaid in most parts of the state. And Colin did a good job mentioning, mentioning support staff too. I didn't put that in my testimony, but that's, he's absolutely right. That's, that's an issue too. And whenever the economy is doing um, not so well, and people are, uh, I mean, uh, doing well, there's people that are out there that have other jobs that pay more money. And we lose many paraprofessionals that say, you know, I can get a, you know, for example, where I live, right next to where I live, there's a new uh, store, a tractor supply store, and they pay more than any of the school districts do for support staff wages. So there's a number of paraeducators in those areas that are saying, well, I'm going go to I'm gonna go work for tractor supply. I make more money. I get a full-time year job, and I get health insurance. Whereas in a school district, sometimes school districts do not offer full family health insurance for paraprofessionals. Many times um, they only offer like a one-person plan, and in some cases they don't offer insurance at all. Uh, I also want to say that the average teacher pay in Vermont is better than the average pay of teachers in most other states nationally, but it's under the states that we compete with, uh, of Connecticut, Maine, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. And, uh, excuse me, did I say Maine? I said Maine twice. It's under Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and New York. It shouldn't read Maine. And slightly better than Maine, New Hampshire, are about the same. Do we have any idea? Not that I expected you to do this, but I do think our kids compete globally. You know, and I do it is interesting, and I know you do too. Yeah. So when we what, did what's this, happening we in did studies China of NAIB and yeah. SBAP when everybody was doing yeah. that. Um, Rebecca did a, a Secretary of Education or Deputy, whatever she was called, Commissioner Holcomb did a study and basically came out with a finding that if Vermont had been a country during that time, we would have came out like 10th or 11th in the whole world mm -hmm. if we were a country. So, and in, what regard, in, in terms of outcomes? In terms of outcomes based on standardized test scores at the time. And that was based on 4th and 8th grade um, I think it was SBAC and NAEP scores, but don't quote me on that. But that was, a, and it was an article in the paper about how that, if we were a country, that's where we would have would finished Vermont. So something to think about. Now our yeah. test scores have declined some in the last few years, yeah. at least as far as NAEP, uh, and we're moving away from SBAC, so it's gonna be hard to know how to compare apples to apples. And it's only one piece of data, but it is something to be mindful of, that Vermont yeah. always finishes. Now Massachusetts But there are nine countries then, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So like Massachusetts, Vermont, I think the other one was either Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Those three, those three, if they had been countries, would have been in the top 10 at that time. And that wasn't that many years ago. Senator Hershey. Thank you. So um, I have two questions. I'm curious about the uh, geographic dynamics. You know, it's, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that compared to the rest of the country, we're, we're doing pretty good, but compared to our region, not doing too great. And, you know, when it comes to teachers, you know, looking for jobs and you know, moving around, you find that they are tending to stay in the New England region, you know, like somebody from Connecticut, you know, if they're shopping around for a new job, are they looking in that area, or do you find that they're coming from all over the country or moving around a lot? What, what you... So I think it's a, it's a little bit of, of all three. I think we have, our society now is more of a, in terms of jobs, it's much more mobile than it used to be, and that's true in every field. So you'll see people that'll be like, oh, I think I'll try teaching in Montana, or I think I'll try being a nurse in Montana, or I'll, a healthcare worker in Montana, because I want to try out that place. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at a region where somebody's choosing in New England, and they have a choice between a job in New York and a choice between a job in Vermont, it's pretty hard for a new person, new teacher, to take the job in Vermont. 
when New York pays so much more and the retirement's, you know, literally a third, at least better. You know, I have a friend who taught at Fairhaven, who was a, when he was a little kid, he went to my baseball camp when I was a coach. And he's now an administrator in Fairhaven, I mean in uh, Graniteville, New York. He went across the bridge and he got like a $30,000 raise yeah. in a couple of years and his retirement's tough. almost double. Yeah, it's and tough so, that, and I don't yeah, know if we can I, compete yeah, with that, yeah. but whatever we can do to help uh, help keep people and retain people. Don Tenney made a good point the other day that I always talk about attracting people, but but the retention power is equally as important. Absolutely. They don't, New York doesn't tax his Social Security. There are several states that don't tax Social Security. I can't be quoted on which ones. I think New York doesn't. I also think either no. Connecticut or Mass, one of those two doesn't. I, I know New York doesn't. Yeah. So that, and that yeah. makes a big difference, It does too. make a big difference. Sure it does. Yeah, yeah. sure it does. Yeah. And in my second question, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the uh, contract negotiating, because I hadn't thought of that or heard of that before. Um, and I'm also curious what Colin might think. Colin's against it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not even looking at him right now. Um, you know, what, one of the things, one of the reasons why I think it's something we should consider is because it's a statewide education system, and all kids should be given the same high level of, of teachers. And what happens right now is the poorer districts train teachers, and they leave to the higher paying districts. Often, not all the time, uh, but when I was superintendent of Essex, we wouldn't even look at a teacher that didn't have five years' experience. When I was superintendent of Franklin Northeast, you know, we would grab teachers as they walked out of the college dorm with their diploma in their hand and try to you know, throw them in the back of a car and kidnap them and make them come teach for us because there was so few candidates. And so there's an advantage to places that are more resourced. So I think that, that is, is time to look at that. A teacher that's working in a place like uh, Bakersfield or North Country or Albert, if anything, the job sometimes is harder in those places than it is in a place that's better resourced. Yet we pay the teachers that are in better resourced communities a lot more than we do teachers in less resourced communities. And that doesn't really make sense to me. So I think it's time that we start looking at those things. I think that, you know, it's hard in a local control state to do that. And there's also the fear from the teachers union, rightfully so, that maybe then if the state's involved, the state will try to lowball teachers. And so that's a legitimate concern. We don't think teachers should be paid less. We just uh, think it should be more equalized. A teacher that's in South Burlington that's making, let's say they're making $80,000, might be making $50,000 up where I live, and they might actually be working with more students uh, with challenging behaviors and certainly more students that are coming from poverty backgrounds. And so there's, there's an equity issue there too. And it's one that we've never addressed as a state. He's coming in Friday. Yeah. Senator Weeks. So I spent a lot of time in this new position to try to differentiate between the problem and the, and the symptom. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the symptom that our, this is one of many symptoms, that our state struggles to pay our teachers um, uh, maybe equitably in comparison to surrounding states, it's, to me it's a symptom. The problem is that we don't, we don't have an economic engine like Connecticut and Massachusetts and New York and Rhode Island. It's difficult, it's not difficult to compare because it's, it's really, it's apples and oranges. So I, I just uh, I, I kind of, uh, re-emphasize uh, that I, I think we we need to be taking a look at the problem and recognize the solution and recognize um, recognize the symptoms recognize solutions to the symptoms but the real fundamental problem is the economy and, and I, I, I think there's some truth to that I also think that another factor there is and this is a you know we've chosen to have really small schools in Vermont um, and because of that we have really small class sizes and smaller schools and smaller class sizes cost more money. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, and, and we did it out of necessity as a state when we first started public education in Vermont because you know we didn't have cars or anything like that. And as a result of that, you know we have a lot of small schools. Act 46 has helped with that some, um, but we've got declining enrollment. And when you have really small schools, you know it does cost more. And it's not like when you lose 20 students in school over a period of four or five years, you can just say, okay, we'll have one less teacher because those kids don't all come out of the third grade. They're spread out over the, over the ecosystem, so that's that's a factor there too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it might have been your testimony which kind of struck me one day. Is I think you mentioned historically Vermont came from a roughly two thousand schools. About three thousand. Three thousand. Yeah. Okay. And we're down to about four hundred and eighty. Something like that. But how you? Count. What's the trend now? Is the trend like have we kind of like hit the what you might consider a low point in that consolidation, or are we I don't still know about that. I don't know what the cost of consolidation, but in terms of the numbers, the the, the uh, census is, is predicting that we're going to be somewhere down in the 60,000s. 
Right now we get eight, just over 80,000. So we're, we still got another 10, 12 years of losing students. Okay, so you're talking student, student numbers. I'm talking student numbers, yes. Right. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the economic engine thing, it's, it's real. It, and it, it is. It helps us re sometimes sort of rethink then, all right, we, how do we attract teachers to this area? I mean, you know, what are what are the highlights? What are that's the that teacher the campaign thing that we keep talking about. Yeah, well, that's Quality that's, of life, right. how great this place yeah. is, yeah. And those types yeah. of things. Yeah, which gets people here. Yeah. Absolutely. It does. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, please. So do you know the demographic on the age of teachers? You know, I remember 15 years ago, it was predicted that we're, we're in an aging population and that we, we didn't have enough health care workers, we didn't have enough nursing homes, and now we're here. We don't have So, right. and I know there are a lot of people that are working in their 70s. Um, so I, I guess we got to look at the whole problem too. Is it going to get better? Because the population uh, demographic, the no. age is, is going to change, or are we going to lose mm -hmm. another 10% of our teachers mm -hmm. in five years? I think we're going to lose another 10% of our teachers so, in five years. So is it is there data anywhere about this age demographic inside the teacher population? For example, but Colin might know the answer. But I, I I don't I don't yeah, know. Yeah, raise your hand. Oh, please, please, Mr. Robinson. Um, I I I can't speak to the specifics. However, um, the teachers' pension system, the Vermont State Teachers' Retirement System, in their annual valuation, does a comprehensive sort of snapshot of who's in the pension, and they're all licensed teachers in our public schools. And so there's a robust data set that talks about a bunch of demographic factors for participants in the pension system. It's not a perfect uh, answer to your question, but um, I will try and find that slide in the- That'd be great valuation and send it along. That'd be helpful, yeah. Because I think, in my mind, the visualization of our population age demographic problem is this big bathtub between 20, 25, and then drops off, and then rises back again at about 45 or so. And I'm wondering if the teacher population, to my colleague's point, is similar, that it's an older teaching. Right. Uh, okay. Right. So you get and, just, and just to weigh, weigh in on it, too, and Colin mentioned the retirement system, and he can correct me if my numbers are wrong, but when I started in education, my understanding that we had something like six or seven or eight teachers for every retired teacher, and now it's almost a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, so that's that's scary too. Yeah, we definitely feels like we need some blueprint going forward. You know, bringing up what both uh, you know Senator Williams said, looking at these numbers realistically, what is retirement going to look like? How can we prepare if all of a sudden things are going to boom drop off again? Yeah, agreed. Mr. Robinson. I, I was just going to provide, I found one of the slides. Okay. So the average age of, according to the pension system, the average age of a teacher in the system is 45.2. Um, and those are active members, Not we're not talking about retirees. Um, and that is a, sl a slight decrease from 45.3 in 2021. Um, and if you, they have a nice chart looking at the ages by five-year increments and it has a nice kind of bell shape to it with the biggest kind of the 40 40 to 44 45 to 49 and 50 to 54 being kind of the peaks of the bell would you mind forwarding that yes. to Hayden yes. and he can share it with the committee thank you very well uh oh, sure. Mr. Francis, do you think you can do this in five minutes? Is that possible? Um, to the extent that I've ever been able to do anything in five minutes, uh, I'll try. I, I am I'm the first witness on meals. so maybe We're going to take a break. We're okay. going to hear from you on this. Uh, and then we're going to take a break. We're going to come back and do about 15 minutes on meals. And then we've got to move on to uh, some folks from UVM. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Um, Jeff Francis from the Superintendent's Association. I'm not sure whether you'll benefit from the fact that I don't have written testimony or not. I ran out of time this morning because we had some unexpected events we had to contend with. Um, let me start by saying that everything that's taken place in the conversation so far resonates with me. Um, because this is a relatively new topic and I didn't have a lot of context for the opinion from superintendents on this topic, what I, I did what I often do, which is I went to 15 leaders in our association, our 10 member board of trustees and five regional group presidents. So that's about 30% of our total membership. 
and I asked them what they thought, and I presented them with a simple question, which was a uniform um, standard salary for the entry-level teacher. Um, all 15 replied. I had seven don't knows, and this is in, in the question, should we do this? Yeah, yeah. Seven don't knows, two knows, and six yeses. That's interesting. So that tells me that this is a worthwhile discussion that requires a lot more discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I then asked them to discuss really with themselves the advantages and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. And the responses were instructive and they're consistent with what you've heard so far. There's a perception that there's a lot of inequity in our delivery system attributable to salaries. And when um, Colin talks about uh, uh, communities that could be construed to be disadvantaged either because of rurality or poverty, I think that that's a good point. And if you if we were to map the starting teacher salaries in the state, and that could relatively easily be done, you'd find that the, the lesser salaries are in the more rural areas mm -hmm. or in communities that, from my experience, I know have um, traditionally had a hard time passing school district budgets. So the pressure on those budgets manifests itself in less access to resources, and that shows up really in all aspects of what the school district is. So that's a that's a generalization, but I think it would hold true um, if you examined it through data mapping and so on and so forth. Um, I also wanted to comment because I'm short on time. I mean, I find the um, the notion that you would use an Act 46 type incentive interesting because if you take a look at the goals of Act 46, and I got them on my phone, I didn't bring them with me, um, but the conversation prompted me to look at them. Um, the, um, the first goal is to provide substantial equity in the quality and variety of educational opportunities statewide. That's a big aspiration for the state. But I do think that when you think about the quality of the education delivery system, you can draw some conclusions around, around the experience of the teachers and the um, capacity of the teachers, which in some ways I think ties to salaries, right? One of the things we hear, um, and this was an argument that, that the, um, the School Boards Association and Superintendent Association brought when you were talking about the bill last year for portability for teachers who had signed contracts. Yeah. And you know what we heard from places in the more rural communities was that they feared that legislation because they thought that the outmigration of teachers that were in transportation proximity to centers of population would exacerbate the problem they had re with retaining a high quality workforce, right? So if you take a look at Franklin County to Chittenden County, for example, what we hear about is teachers will go to the northern tier, Mississippi Valley and Franklin Northeast, they'll gain experience, and then they'll move to the Chittenden County area for dramatic salary increases. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. So, um, so the other goal of Act 46 that I wanted to mention, and I'd be happy to come back and talk to you about this if you find that it's a worthwhile conversation, was goal number three, which says maximize operational efficiencies through increased flexibility to manage, share, and transfer resources with a goal of increasing the district level ratio of students to full time equivalent. Um, my colleague Jay Nichols talked about our, our desire in the state to operate a lot of small schools. And there's a lot of overhead associated with operating any school. So we're looking at it with school facilities right now. One of the challenges we have with school facilities are how do you maintain so too many buildings? So to the extent that you go down this road of discussing this and you wanted to use some sort of a Act 46 type philosophy or operational practice in order to generate the money to, to increase base salaries, I think you could look at the systems that we have in the state and apply some kind of an efficiency test. Like, did they do what was intended with Act 46 yeah. in terms of how they manage their organizations? Because places that have 
a larger complement of staff, even if they're serving multiple buildings, have flexibility in terms of how they deploy that staff. The other thing that would be interesting to look at, um, and I just by way of analysis, is what happens with our staff with respect to declines in enrollment. Now, if, if you ask me the question, what's the current status, I would say that the pressures on public education right now are so great that we're contending with a worker shortage because we don't see a need to diminish staff. But if things were to normalize and you were able to pay people more to teach, then you might be able to rely more on teachers and less on paraeducators, which was a premise of Act 173 in terms of what the overall quality of the system should be. So that, I mean, the reason that I say that this is a um, worthwhile discussion that needs more discussion is because just around this issue alone, those are the kinds of things that, that you could think about and look into. In terms of sort of the simplicity, what I heard from su superintendents were they would favor an examination of our salaries for the most obvious reason, which is you want to be able to recruit. You don't want a district advantaged or disadvantaged on the basis of starting salary when you're trying to hire the best teachers. Yep. And, and this was a point um, that Senator Weeks made, I think, um, uh, the expectation should be that if you up the minimum, that everything else is going to flow out of that. So, you know, I think the thought that I would leave you in summary is this is connected to everything else you're doing. I, I'm a, I will connect it to meals when I switch yeah. my hats. Um, and it is um, tied to what's the organizational structure of the delivery system what methods we use to deploy our staff, how we collectively bargain. And, you know, if you, for lack of a better way to say it, now that healthcare is out of local bargaining, if you take salaries out of local bargaining, what are you then dealing with, right? So one of the comments that I had from superintendents were, this may seem simple, but keep in mind that like some of the higher paid teachers in the state may only be working a seven hour workday and some of the lesser paid are, are on an eight hour workday. So, you know, even the length of the day comes into the conversation. I'll, I will stop here except to say, if you want to pursue this further, and I think it is worthwhile because we want to be competitive in the region yep. and competitive within the systems in Vermont, there's a, a lot to tease out, and, and the witnesses you've already heard from, and me, and people we can each bring to the table can inform the conversation. But there's nothing simple about it. Committee, uh, I'm going to have to stop there just to get us back on track. I apologize. We are going to uh, take a five minute break right now, then we're going to come back in the room and pick up I'll the right here. Okay. Well, yeah, is it relevant to what we're talking yep. about right now, not necessarily school meals? Can I just make a quick comment? Yeah. Okay, because I've been holding my thoughts for a while. Um, number one, education is expensive. We know that. But we also know that educating kids saves money down the line, right? Downstream. We know that, number one. Number two, we like our small schools. Um, when we even whisper the word consolidation in Burlington, we it's like, no. We, we love our small schools in Vermont. Number three, it's really hard to have this discussion without mentioning the elephant in the room, which is that when you're going to talk about declining enrollment, you've got to address the fact that we have students going to private schools and we have public money going to private schools. Those are two things that if we're going to have this discussion, we need to address as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. So about five minutes and then we'll come back and we will jump in with school meals and I think we're jumping in. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Welcome back to Senate Education uh, this Wednesday, February 1st. Universal School Meals Campaign. Mr. Francis, uh, eager to hear your thoughts. And then uh, Mr. Nichols and Mr. Tinney. Thank you. Um, Jeff Francis from the Vermont Superintendents Association. Um, thanks for having me here to take to, today to talk about school meals. Um, in the last testimony that I gave on the minimum salary, I talked about a survey that I did because it was a topic that our organization had not delved into fully at this point. 
Um, universal school meals is something that we're well familiar with because of the deliberation debate, et cetera, last year. Yeah. Um, so I tested my testimony, um, which is simple, with the same folks, trustees and regional group presidents. And um, really, we're here to convey three points. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you what they are. These are the high level points. And then I'll um, elaborate a bit and answer questions. The first is um, the position of the Superintendents Association is that in Vermont, we should continue to fund universal school meals at the state level. Um, last year, we talked about whether we should be funding universal meals, not because it's not a laudable and necessary pursuit, but because of the um, utilization of dollars from the Ed Fund and the fact that peace, uh, school meals was in competition with some other state priorities. I'll come back to that. Um, the second uh, point that I wanted to make is that the General Assembly should be looking for a new source of funds to pay for it so as to not put added pressure on existing revenue sources. And the specific point there is last year, um, money came from the um, reserves. That's right. Presumably this year, there would be money in the reserves if you chose to use them that way, but the reserves are not going to exist forever. Yeah. So if you rely on reserves for one or two years and then you don't have sufficient reserves to put into a focused program like Universal School Meals, by definition, there's going to be pressure put on other areas. Um, and because superintendents have to concern themselves with all manners of operations of local school districts, it's hard for us as an association to say, we're gonna put this purpose above all other purposes. And what our priorities are this year are um, facilities, mm -hmm. mental health, and worker shortage. Um, we were just talking about worker shortage in the earlier session um, in the context of um, increasing salaries. Well, if you were to increase salaries, presumably the burden to do that would fall someplace. So um, we are supportive of universal school meals and the provision thereof. And one of the reasons why our testimony is that we should continue to fund them at the state level is, um, and I'm going to pause here and say, I do not consider myself an expert on this. So people could challenge it, they could um, amplify it, they could clarify it. Sure. But what I've learned in the time that I've been able to spend on the topic is that now that we've got school meals integrated into the delivery system in Vermont, and we do, starting with districts that chose to fund them prior to COVID, the federal resources that brought about the delivery of universal school meals it would be disruptive if you stop that practice in a couple of different ways. One, you would have places that um, would want to continue. Um, and if it wasn't funded at the state level, it would, in fact, fall back on the lo local tax burden, which we argued against in our uh, discussions last year. Um, so that would be disruptive. And there would be two, some of the um, communities that have a harder time funding anything would be wedded to universal school meals. There could be community pressure to stop on the basis of budgetary considerations alone. That um, is too big a toll to take on the system for something as purposeful and useful as providing universal school meals. So whereas last year I might have argued about a choice, PCB mitigation, for example, versus providing universal school meals, I think the fact that um, we are where we are in this process necessitates continuing. Um, what I don't want to have happen, nor would my association, is to not um, be able to achieve what needs to be achieved um, in terms of uh, facilities improvements. And I would include PCBs as a subset. We don't know how much that yeah. is going to yeah. ultimately cost. Um, uh, mental health, which is going to require dollar investment, presumably, and how do you contend with worker shortage? So I'm not saying, um, nor would I say, elevate universal school meals among those other policy choices. What I'm saying is we've got a good start on universal school meals. We should continue to provide them. 
and the General Assembly is going to have some tough decisions to make from a policy standpoint um, around how the funding comes ultimately, where it comes from to do that. So a month from now, if you came in and said, finite set of resources, we have to make the hardest decisions, what do you want to do now among universal school meals and some of the other priorities, I'd say, I've got to go back to my association yeah. and ask that. But where we are today in terms of where we've come on universal school meals, our position is continue to fund them, but look for a source. And I know that a source is a topic of conversation in this building, yeah. and I'd encourage you to pursue that. The last two points I'll make, um, one is um, I know that we need to find a way to maximize the federal resources that are available and perfect the system with regard to how these meals are delivered. So, um, and I'm not an expert in this, but yeah, folks who are, you know, a, a, a piece of feedback that came from several of the superintendents when I tested those points in terms of our um, testimony, they were like, yes, we still see problems with the free and reduced meal application and the following participation and how that results uh, in title monies. From a conversation that I had with Rosie Kruger, it yeah. seems like we're on that in terms of figuring it out, but we need to know in the field with a fair amount of authority how that's going to be done and that we can continue to uh, maximize federal resources through however we're accounting for, for um, uh, free and reduced meal counts. And I, I'm not even sure I have the top terminology right, uh, but I, I think you know what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and the and the third thing and is um, it, I guess I guess it was just those main two points. The, there was a third one I've forgotten. It, so. Okay. I made it this far without forgetting <laughs> anything though, so I'm happy, yeah. happy to. Pretty have good. Point. Questions so, for Mr. Francis. I appreciate it. Yeah, please. So you mentioned uh, going back to your constituents and, and potentially asking them to rank. Is right. that an exercise you think you'll do so that we can kind of get a sense of how they prioritize? Yeah, I mean, I, um, we could do that. I think that the way that they would prioritize, though, would challenge them because of the points I made about how far we've come with the delivery of universal school meals, right? So. It was a, it was a, there was a political contest around it last year because we were trying to utilize or trying to help the General Assembly decide how to use the um, reserves and the Ed Fund that they had available to them. And that got worked out uh, because there was a larger reserve. I, I think that, um, direct answer to the question, yes, I could do that. I'm hoping to not have to do it because I'm hoping that you'll find a revenue source for universal school meals and then we'll deal with the rest of it however we're going to deal with the rest of it. Yeah, we're going to, we will, I mean, this is going to go on, I imagine, for another couple of weeks, conversations with appropriations, excess spending, all that kind of thing. Right. So, but this is helpful. Yeah, Thank and if you. I, my, my, I guess my closing comment, which will come as no surprise, I mean, we really want the General Assembly to turn into facilities needs. Yeah. Um, because many of the arguments that are made around health, safety, stigma can be translated from meals to facilities, including personnel in facilities. Like you're talking about how do we attract the teachers? It's easier to attract yeah. teachers to work in a, a nice modern building than totally. it is one that's antiquated. Mental health, you know, that's a very challenging issue yeah. that's going to have a lot of participants engaged. Um, and um, worker shortage, to the extent you need money to incentivize things like teacher salaries, for example, it's going to require a resource. So I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm just saying it's sure. a big, we've got a lot of challenges. Mr. Nichols, do you mind jumping in? <laughs> Thank know. you. For the record, Jay Nichols, the Executive Director of Vermont Principals Association again. I'm not going to repeat any of the points that uh, Mr. Francis and the superintendents just made. Uh, my testimony is similar to what it was last year. I've given you a copy there. Essentially, um, the principals are very supportive of universal meals for students. Our concern, again, is the funding source. We yeah. do not want to see it be part of school budgets. 
And the reason for that is because if it's a requirement and it's part of a school budget and a school budget goes down, schools cannot cut that. So you might have a situation where you have kids who are parents have a lot of money getting universal meals while you're having to cut a reading teacher or something like that. So that's a concern. And then in terms of off the ed fund, it's the same thing. It's a property tax shift from our perspective. And we think there should be a different funding source for it as we talked about last year. And we are against anything uh, being added to the ed fund when we constantly hear pressures about spending too much money in the ed fund, spending too much money in public education, then let's not add things that are societal issues to the ed fund. Let's pay for them out of the general fund or some other revenue source that's transparent, open, and straight to the point. This is why we're doing this, is to pay for school meals for all students, whatever that whatever that thing might be. Senator uh, I'm curious, so cutting programs, cutting teachers, is that something that happened um, in the last year when when this no uh, because extra excess funds were used for it uh, it didn't cost the school districts any money oh right okay you know, and during covid it was paid for federally and we were hoping as was hunger free vermont and everybody else that the feds were going to step up it was in the bill that the president put forward and it was part of the trade-off of joe mansion when, when sign off on the on the big bill i don't know what they call it the big bill is what i call it and, they, and so i got taken out of the the budget bill because in the beginning of that bill there was a whole bunch of money for school infrastructure and for paying for meals <coughs> and there's the another pay. bill we heard this morning in ag before congress that would do this but very little hope that it right was gonna and it'd be go. great if it did yeah but, uh, I know. that's the concern senator williams just wondering yeah uh, you know we got to fix the problem in the state but we can we should probably think about how we can engage the federal government yeah. Be at that one. Yeah. So this morning in Ag, we had uh, folks from Ballant, uh, Welch, and Sanders in Ag talking about this issue a little bit in the Farm Bill, and this popped up. And you know, of course, they're sympathetic. There's a bill in Congress right now that would provide universal school meals. Two of them voted for it last year. Of course, Ballant wasn't there, so she, she yeah. Didn't vote for it. But it's it's just uh, they're not feeling terribly optimistic that it's it's going to get through but for what it's worth the, the federal delegation knows that it's something we would like to get more support on yeah dan you raise i mean real points i mean i think joint fiscal is coming out today or tomorrow with the final numbers on what it has cost over the past couple of years yeah. over the past year so that'll help guide us a little bit in terms of what's needed right Absolutely. And if it's, yeah. I think it was estimated at 30. Yeah, we said like 27, 28 million is what we thought, but I think it's, I think I heard it might be less than that. I, I don't know. Don't, don't for know. sure. I don't know for sure. <laughs> and we're willing to work with the AOE and folks on, and with Rosie on the, you know, the collection forms and universal yeah. income form or something that makes that process simpler. But just got a good point. Superintendent, I've talked to said the same thing. We want to make sure the state can draw down all the title monies that we possibly can. Yeah. That, that's a big support for a lot of our poorer schools. The areas that have done it, I think California's done it, New York's done it, a few others. This one paper that I'll share with the committee, and we're going to hear from the researcher, hopefully, does show, you know, universal school meals, and I know you're pro-universal school meals, it's just funny, do improve test scores and has reduced incidence of bad behavior. And, you know, Jeff made a point about facilities. I teach yeah. a class on school um, ethics institutions and law or whatever for yeah. some universe. I can't think what it's called anymore. but. For new, for new people that are becoming principal before they become principal. And there's a lot of research in there around lighting in buildings yeah. and attractiveness of the building and how kids feel belonging, and that helps to improve test scores. So it's, it's all connected. Yeah. Could you send us some info on that? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great yeah, for us to air see. Quality. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, air quality yeah. is another thing. Yeah. yeah, I definitely can do yeah. that. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Mr. Tinney. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Don Tinney, 31-year veteran English teacher from South Harrow, currently serving as president of Vermont NEA. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today as you consider legislation to make universal school meals permanent in all Vermont schools. This important program has not only improved the health and nutrition of Vermont's children and youth, but has sent a clear message to every student, we care about you. I submitted formal testimony to Hayden earlier today, so in the interest of time, I'll summarize my main points this afternoon. Uh, before war, no one has ever accused me of being a fast talker, however. <laughs> we all know how important good nutrition is for good health throughout our lives, and nourishing meals support adequate brain development and functioning for not just academic learning, 
but for social interactions as well. So nutritious meals are an essential part of the school day, as the paper you just mentioned refers to. When students are hungry, they simply cannot concentrate on class activities. Students distracted by their hunger simply cannot learn because they cannot focus on their lessons. And when students can't focus, they tend to distract their peers, thereby disrupting other students' learning opportunities. As you all know, everyone involved in public education went above and beyond the call of duty to keep our students physically in school during the pandemic, because we all know that school is much, much more than just a place to deliver instruction. Students need to be in school for their mental health, their social and emotional well-being, and their connection to the greater community. All students must feel welcomed and safe and nurtured at school. As I have said in earlier testimony, every school must be a sanctuary for every student. Providing healthy universal breakfast and lunch for all students is one of the most effective ways of achieving this goal. Because we have done this since the start of the pandemic, not only do we know how important it is, but we also know how doable it is. At our fall district meetings around the state this year, the consensus was clear that Vermont educators want to see universal school meals become permanent. Removing the stigma attached to the free and reduced system has made a world of difference for many of our students. Why would we go backward? The Universal School Meals Program is working. Our educators see the direct benefits in assuring that their students are not going hungry. As a third grade teacher in her 23rd year of teaching said to me just this week, Universal School Meals are a godsend. Nourishing our students, satisfying their hunger, and quenching their thirst is as important as delivering academic instruction. Universal school meals contribute to a student's sense of belonging to the greater school community, which enhances academic achievement. Vermont NEA stands in full support of universal breakfast and lunch programs in our schools. Because this nutrition program is as essential to the operation of a school as books, electricity, adequate staffing, up-to-date technology, and well-maintained buildings, we believe the cost of universal school bills meals needs to come out of the state education fund without attribution to any specific district, then spread across the full ed fund for tax purposes. Our national leadership, including President Becky Pringle, are all working diligently at the federal level to find additional funding for universal school meals throughout the nation. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Committee, questions for Mr. Timmy? Should you record note I'm under five minutes? Yeah, I was just uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No, you go ahead. You no, no, please. Well, I have more of a comment. I apologize, it's not really a question, but um, this is such an important issue. Um, I, you all know I was a teacher for many, many years and I completely understand the importance of food and well-fed children. Um, I'm also, I think, the only person in this room who went through a school closure and the trauma that accompanies that. I ran my campaign based on construction, school construction and fixing our school buildings. And I'm not gonna let that die. Um, it was extremely traumatic for our students, our parents, our community to lose a school. And you wanna talk about stigma? We have kids going to school in a Macy's. We have a Michael's Core Cafe. <coughs> it's got Michael's Coors, you know, emblem all over the place. And our library is in a shoe department. So as we re really need to be thoughtful about this. Um, this is really important, but so is, um, so are buildings that are safe, that are inviting, and that are not stigmatizing. Because what we have right now is stigma. Kids who walk into Burlington High School feel the shame. Their neighbors are walking into, for example, CVU, a nice updated school. This is important stuff, and we're going to have to really dive into how we're going to pay for this, because it's extremely critical and I mean you can you can see I'm emotional about this because it was a real blow to our community and I don't want it to happen to any other community in the state so thank you for listening sure. and I, I just please. respond saying yeah, it's please. not I hope we're not framing this as an either or I hope situation not. and, and I, that when when we're in the mindset of scarcity 
that we start either or, but I think we need to approach this from a mindset of abundance because we're talking about our children, all of our children. And I absolutely agree that, that the physical building does matter. And we know that to Mr. Francis's point, it does matter for teach, teacher retention that people don't want to stay in buildings that are not kept up. We have, we have educators who are told to use the latest technology. They have one electrical outlet in their classroom, right? So it's, yeah. that, it's yeah. that extreme. I, I also just hope that we can all work together on this and that we don't vilify those who might have um, a difference of opinion or a different way of looking at it or it is someone who is in search of a different answer. Um, there's, there's a lot of pressure right now and I just hope that we can all work together and, and um, respect each other. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Very helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Mitty, any other questions before Mr. Tinney uh, departs? I have lots of opinions left. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professors uh, Schulz in Reardon. How are you? Good, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Professor Schulz is uh, Associate Professor of Special Education at Northern University, Northern Vermont University. And Rick Reardon is the Director of Castleton Center for Schools at Castleton University. And we appreciate both of you coming to uh, Senate Education. Uh, what we are just trying to make our way through a little bit is teacher education. Uh, you know, we, we've talked today a little bit in committee around teacher salaries, how to attract teachers. We're hearing that not as many uh, Americans are going into the profession. We're also interested in figuring out ways to maybe which already exists, but streamline some of these kind of certification programs. We know you can go, uh, I believe the NEA and the Principal Association, Superintendent Association has directed us sometimes to these sort of portfolio reviews with colleagues, all sorts of things. So, but we've also heard two years ago, I'll be frank, we had two teachers in here that said we, in that we never asked them what college university they went to. I want to be perfectly clear. For all we know, they came from the University of California, Los Angeles. But there were two Vermont teachers that said, listen, folks, we never learned how to really teach reading and writing. And so we put together, because of that and other factors, a literacy bill that we're going to learn more about in the coming days, but we thought the two of you could just give us a sense of what it's like to educate a teacher today in the 21st century at our Vermont uh, institutions of higher education. So with that, I don't know which of you uh, would like to start. I've got Ms. Professor Schulz on the list first, uh, and I'm seeing from uh, Ms. Lavasser, who is the silent vice chair of the committee sometimes. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Please, go ahead, Mr. Professor Souls. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let me just preface this by saying that I tested positive for COVID this morning. Uh, so I, I am not at my peak of eloquence today. So please, please, please bear with me as, I, as, I'm, as I'm talking through this. Forgive, forgive me any stutters. Um, so again, uh, my name is Dr. Rob Schultz. I'm the professor of special education at Northern Vermont University, Johnson, which is soon to become the Johnson campus of Vermont State University. Uh, and I'm very pleased to speak on behalf of Vermont State in regard to our undergraduate programs uh, in education at the university. Um, I, I'm just gonna talk through a bit about what we offer, uh, what we're going to offer uh, in the next, in the coming years. And then I would be happy to answer questions on any specifics that I didn't touch on. Um, sure. so, so just as a refresher, uh, this coming summer, uh, the four former state colleges, uh, Johnson and Lamoille County, Castleton and Rutland County, Linden and Caledonia County, and Vermont Tech, which has multiple locations, but which has its main campus in Orange County, are combining into one institution of Vermont State University. As part of this unification, the undergraduate education programs, which previously were completely separate at the different campuses with different courses of study, different state ROPA approvals, uh, have combined into one unified department with one program of study which will be consistent across the campuses. Uh, and I'm excited to tell you about the different education programs which will be offered. 
uh, to the future teachers of Vermont and what that means for our workforce. So first, at the elementary or kindergarten to sixth level, uh, Vermont State University is not doing separate elementary and special education training programs, uh, but rather one inclusive childhood education degree where all students will graduate with both regular and special education endorsements. Uh, this is a program which has existed at the Johnson and Linden campuses to great success and which is being adopted across the VTSU. Uh, whereas in many teacher ed programs, special education is an optional credential or an add-on to an education program. At Vermont State, it's a core component of the education that all elementary education students receive. Uh, our courses integrate special education and regular education content, preparing our students to teach all of their future students. In the senior year, the students do a full year in public schools with time divided among regular and special education to get them hands-on experience in both areas. In this way, everyone benefits. So our graduates are better teachers who have double the available job opportunities. And with special education being an area of dire shortage in the state, uh, the pool of qualified candidates for those positions is increased. Um, and that's something that we're that we're very proud of. Um, in addition- so I'm sorry, you're, oh, yeah. So you're seeing an increase in applicants, that's great. Yeah, um, yeah, our elementary numbers are are looking pretty good. They're looking, they're looking, they're looking steady, and certainly the number of graduates with special education certifications has dramatically risen since we put this program into place at the Johnson and Linden campuses. It's coming to Castleton beginning next year. Um, in a brand new program that's which is designed to begin next year with the launch of the Vermont State University. Uh, we'll be introducing a complementary program in inclusive adolescent education for teachers who are looking for endorsement at the high school level. These are your traditional high school math teachers, high school science teachers, et cetera. The program is similar in that it integrates the special education content with the secondary instruction to prepare teachers to work with all students in their content areas, which is sorely needed in Vermont schools. Due to the larger course needs of majoring in a content area, for instance, you have to be a biology major to be a biology teacher. You have to have a full math major to be a math teacher. Uh, in addition to the education program, these students won't get a special education endorsement upon their undergraduate graduation. However, the program is designed so that they only will need six graduate credits after graduation to earn that endorsement, meaning it's creating a, a clear path to adding more special educators and to steering our new teachers towards additional professional education when they're in the field. And we're very excited to launch this program. Uh, we feel like it's been a need. We've, we've focused on the inclusion for K-12, I'm sorry, K-6 teachers for a long time. And it's time that our high school teachers received this similar um, preparation. And so we're very excited to launch this. And finally, aside from elementary, secondary, and special education, uh, Vermont State will also offer endorsement in other areas of need. One is what we refer to as the unified arts. These are the teachers for specialty fields such as phys ed and art. Uh, these programs are not going to be offered at all campuses like the other ones that I've mentioned will, but they're specialized to the expertise of the faculty at different campuses. So for instance, phys ed and music will only be at Castleton while theater arts will only be at Johnson. And relatedly, the Vermont tech programs for industrial arts and other career and technical education programs will continue their good work. Uh, from the Randolph campus. Uh, and also our very successful early childhood education programs, which have been extremely successful, um, especially out of the Linden campus, in trying to meet those preschool, both public and private needs, um, are going to continue, uh, both, again, both for public preschool programs and private practice. And I, I feel very entitled to speak for all of the education faculty at the state colleges when I say that we're excited about the unification and what our programs mean for both our students and the state. Our data shows that the majority of teachers in the Vermont State College teacher ed programs are from Vermont and stay in Vermont. And so we in the state college system have a great deal of influence, I think, on how our schools are going to perform looking forward. You know, and we take this responsibility seriously. And our plan is to continue to graduate the best teachers we can to serve to serve the students of Vermont. And so that's the overview of what we have going on and coming up in the next year for the Vermont State Colleges. 
And I'd be happy to answer any other questions or more specifics uh, that you'd like to know. Well, first of all, thanks for doing this, especially, you know, be feeling under the weather. We really appreciate it. I just want to clarify. So it sounds like with the unification, somebody that's going to leave Northern University, Northern Vermont University or Castleton University is going to basically be the same quality of teacher, same kinds of requirements, same kinds of rigor, all that kind of thing. Unlike Maine that, that we've heard, cool. Maine is, yeah, okay. Did you say that's the plan? Yeah, that is the plan. Right. Yep. In the past, each campus had its own program, and they were yeah. dramatically different, and they did dramatically different things. But they should be re they should be quite standardized. And a teacher coming out of Castleton going to a Rutland school, a teacher coming out of Johnson going to a St. Albans school, they should have yeah. the same preparation and the same content. Did you say that people, uh, teachers that need to teach at high school, whether biology or history, they're getting a biology degree? Also, yeah. So for, for licensing purposes, elementary teachers and special educators, they can major in education only. And, okay. that, and that, that's a that's a ROPA. That's that's a, a state rule thing. And they take courses in what they teach. You know, they take history courses and, and um, English courses, but they can major in education. But if you're okay. going to be a secondary teacher, you have to major in that content area. And um, Biology is a huge degree. <laughs> I don't know if anybody uh, in, in, your, in your committee majored in science. It takes a lot of effort. And so it's it's not as much room to do additional education courses as there is for you know uh, elementary students. Great. Professor Reardon, would you like to, to add a few words and, and, and talk with us a little bit about your work? Uh, certainly. Uh, first, Rob, nice job uh, being under the weather. Um, very similar to what's happening at Castleton. So I'm the director of education at Castleton. So I play two roles really there. Um, I help to support the education faculty with the work that we do in education licensure. So our pre-service work, but I also direct the Castleton Center for Schools, which provides professional development for practicing teachers. And that's kind of the, the role that I wanted to kind of uh, talk about uh, today. Um, so our center has been around since 2002, and we offer institutes and trainings, symposiums, independent studies, workshops, and over 350 graduate level courses a year for Vermont teachers, support staff, and administrators. And the, the center is a result of a vision from our former president, Dave Walk, who um, wanted to provide some rigorous and relevant professional development opportunities for what he called the lower half of the state, where he sort of felt the opportunities were scarce. So we started out 20 years ago offering maybe 20, 25 courses a year to a few local districts. Um, and now we have a presence in all 14 Vermont counties, impacting the vast majority of the state's 300 plus schools. Um, teachers and other educators use our coursework for relicensure, they use it them to add to a teaching endorsement. Uh, they might want to use them to move along their district's salary schedule, which typically tends to be credit driven as well. They might use them as electives to jump into a degree program. Uh, and probably most importantly, they use the courses that we provide to improve practice. So at, at the Center for Schools, we typically try to look at the provision of of professional development for teachers along a continuum. And that continuum starts with pre-service, which Rob did a nice job of describing what typically happens for our, our pre-service teachers. Mm -hmm. What we try to do at that point when students get hired out of our programs is to support the induction, the mentoring, the coaching, the ongoing professional development, and then eventually their opportunity to earn an advanced degree. Um, through the coursework that they take. And so that's the connection we try to make. We try to bridge the learning of pre-service teachers with continuing ed opportunities for practicing teachers once they're hired. Some of the courses that we offer uh, and the professional development that we provide are specifically uh, intended to address things like induction and mentoring and coaching. We are partnering right now with the Agency of Education to help with the mentoring project for brand new special education teachers. 
Um, some of our courses are used for professional development that's typically aligned with their district's continuous improvement plans. And then other courses, as I said before, are transferred into graduate programs upon matriculation. So I did want to mention the sort of working toward an advanced degree aspect of the continuum that I had mentioned previously and, and my center's role there, because I think this part of the work we do tends to get buried in the lead when we talk about the center. So there have been many occasions when in my role as director of the center, I've marketed degree programs to course participants, and many of them eventually decide to matriculate uh, into one of our graduate programs in special education or educational leadership or educational research. And then they transfer those courses they took with my center into those degree programs. For instance, in the last two years, we have run a cohort of 29 teacher leaders out of the Northeast Kingdom and Rutland City through our Master of Arts in Educational Leadership program with principal endorsement, um, following the connections I was able to make through the center role that I play. And right now there are two additional cohorts of 21 teacher leaders out of the SVSU in Bennington and uh, Bennington Rutland Supervisory Reunion that are part of our current cohort of principal candidates. And I would tell you that given the shortage of principals in the state, we now have 58 candidates in our current leadership program at Castleton. We are also very proud of the professional partnerships that we have with Jay at the uh, Vermont Principals Association, uh, Chelsea and Jeff at the VSA, Jeff Evans at the uh, Curriculum Leaders Association, Darren with the special ed group, uh, many of the staff members of the Agency of Education are partnering with us, and we have a lot of early childhood partners as well, like Building Bright Futures and Let's Grow Kids, because of the Early Childhood Educators Institute that we facilitate every year and have for the last seven years. So uh, I, I think what we probably do best at the center is to listen to the field and try to respond with uh, proposed support options that meet the unique needs of, of uh, and the pressing needs in the schools. So like for instance, right now we're working with Orleans Southwest Supervisory Union on offering a series of five behavior support courses for a number of their staff members who are working with students with some pretty significant behavior challenges in their schools. And down South in the SVSU, we're, uh, we facilitated some book studies and some other professional development helping their staff and administrators understand the challenges and the rewards connected with including kids with disabilities in general ed learning environments. Um, I also sit on monthly meetings with the assistant superintendents and the directors of curriculum down here in the Southwest quadrant of the state. Those are the folks who are in charge of professional development in their districts. And I try to respond to their individual and collective requests for professional development. Some of that professional development is offered across multiple districts. We call that points of commonality. And some of it is offered specifically to a school or a district with a, a unique need. So we are convinced in our little center that the model of listening to the field and working hard to present, to be, to be present in the schools to get a feel for the culture of those schools and the inner workings of those schools works really well for us. And we plan, even with the merger, to make sure that we maintain the opportunity to continue to do that. And before I take questions, I wanted to also sort of very quickly comment on Rob's uh, presentation of the dual endorsement with special education. I'm a 19-year special educator, uh, special ed director, special ed professor myself. And um, living in Vermont and knowing how inclusive we are, the fact that our teachers will be able to leave with a dual endorsement where they're going to be able to teach kindergarten through sixth grade or kindergarten through eighth special ed um, is, a, is an incredible benefit for them. They, might, they may not ever become special educators. They may teach third grade their whole career, but to have that additional knowledge base of how to support kids who struggle and differentiate the scaffold learning um, to walk out with those additional skills 
um, is incredibly, incredibly important. And, and um, we're so thrilled at Castleton to be able to sort of brag about that new program as we move to becoming merged. And so uh, I love, uh, as Rob said, I love the idea and I love the fact that it may make them doubly marketable. But beyond that, as a special educator, they're better informed of what happens in general ed settings. And as a general educator, they're better informed about what support looks like to level the playing field. So I'll stop there. So with your dual role, um, the special educator and the general education, is there any recertification, any plans for recertification for the ones that want to keep that certification but don't actually teach in special ed? Yeah, well, we're going to highly recommend that they continue to keep their certification up. So when they leave, they'll have current licensure for seven years. Um, and if they want to open up, they want to keep their options open down the road, the best thing they can do is to continue to take a course or two in special ed as they're moving their way through their career. And then when it comes time to recertify, they're going to recertify K-6. Uh, but we also ask them to consider uh, recertifying in that area as well. Thank you. Would you both be willing to send your written testimony to us? That would be very helpful, as well as, I don't know if it's going to be a photocopy from the course catalog, but I'd like, and I'd like the committee to see that trajectory from arriving as a first year student to graduation, what courses, you know, what the options are, what a, what a teacher is going to graduate with, whether it's elementary or high school special ed, just special ed, or, you know, the, the sort of additional six credits that you've been referencing. Would you like that for all programs, uh, music and, you know, tech too, or just for the academic programs? Uh, I think just the, for me, just the academic program, just, that would give me a taste of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that'd be great. Any other questions for either uh, Professor Reardon or Schultz? Thank you both for joining us. This is very helpful. You're very welcome. Good luck for the rest of the day. Thanks. We'll be back in touch if we have uh, additional questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. That's exciting. Dual endorsement. I like that. Who wants a quick ice cream break? Um, yes. Okay. Where? Come back in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Senate Education. We're going to continue our conversation now on teacher education with uh, the Dean of the University of Vermont College of Education and Social Services, uh, Professor Katie Shepard. Uh, and so I see, and the, the chair of the department, uh, Professor Kimberly Benest. We really appreciate the two of you being with us. What we are trying to just get our head around, uh, our heads around, is what does it look like to be, become a teacher here in the state of Vermont? We just heard from our state colleges uh, what their programs look like, uh, and we wanted to hear from the university as well a little bit of, of what that path is from arrival to graduation. Uh, we've also heard, and well, I, it's not anecdotal. We, we've, we've heard nationwide statistics uh, that fewer people are going into the profession. Uh, we'd like to hear what the university is seeing, uh, if that is true. It doesn't seem to be true with our state colleges. It sounds like applications are pretty robust. And then a little bit around uh, you know, elementary school teacher versus secondary school teacher, uh, and then special ed. So with that, I know you have some prepared testimony, which we have in front of us, and we'll turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and uh, to, to share with you what we're doing at the University of Vermont, and also I think to engage in potentially a longer term conversation about the issues that you're raising, uh, including how it is that we're preparing our educators and how we might approach what we do see in the field as, as a growing teacher shortage. Um, and, and I'll come back to the issue of what we're seeing in terms of applications at UVM. We're like the state colleges, we're holding pretty stable in terms of applications and interest. 
And we have a few concerns that I'll, I'll share a little bit later. Um, so I, the prompt we received did ask us to give you a bit of an overview of teacher preparation and then maybe to touch more specifically on uh, preparation as it relates to literacy across the different grade levels and bands. So that's where we'll start. And then uh, we'll be glad to take questions at the end. Um, we're really interested in what you're hearing and seeing and, and wondering about as well. So, so again, thanks for having us here. Uh, and, and I should start before, before or I should say before we start that uh, both Kimber and I are special educators by training. So we happen to be in leadership positions, but we both come from the, spiel, the field of special education. And I started my career as a special educator at the Duxbury Elementary School in Duxbury, Vermont, which of course no longer exists. So perhaps that dates me a bit, but anyway, <laughs> those are my roots. And those are important to me as we think about teacher education. So to start just at the big picture level, uh, UVM does provide state and nationally accredited teacher education programs. We're the only nationally accredited uh, program in, in Vermont. We're accredited by the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. Uh, and at the undergraduate level, we have a number of licensure programs across pre-K through 12. So those include early childhood education, elementary education, middle level education, and secondary education. We also offer some additional licensure pathways through um, a minor in education for cultural and linguistic diversity. And then we have accelerated master's programs into special education. And that includes both early childhood special education and K-12 special education. We are also uh, well on our way to developing a new major in special education, which we've not had before. And that uh, will cover PK through 12 with options for students to specialize at different grade bands. So we're very, very excited about that. Uh, our graduate level programs include programs in special education, reading and literacy, ed technology, school library and media science to name our primary ones. And then we have a couple of graduate level certificate programs, many of which are accessed by teachers, though they don't lead to licensure. And, and those are the, our resiliency-based approaches certificate and our education for sustainability um, certificate. Then we have a set of master's and doctoral programs. Again, these are not only accessed by teacher educators, but they do, they are accessed by some teachers and they certainly help to um, build our leadership pathways in Vermont. So those include a master's degree in educational leadership, a doctoral program in educational leadership and policy studies, and a brand new PhD uh, that we'll be launching this fall in social, emotional, behavioral health and inclusive education. Uh, so, you know, what does it look like? When our students come in, um, they are taking typically a set of core courses for their first year. So, and, and we're working on, we're actually in the middle of revamping and revising and updating our core courses, but those core courses bring together all of our teacher education candidates. So regardless, regardless of which major they intend to pursue or claim at the time of admittance or may transfer into after a while, uh, they do get some common, um, common content and curriculum. Uh, so they currently are all taking a course having to do with students with disabilities, as well as a course that talks about uh, multilingual learners and related race and racism issues. Um, once students leave that, that, well, and along with the core courses in our college, first year students are taking a range of distribution requirements across the university. So the majority of our students will try to satisfy a lot of those general ed requirements in their first couple of years uh, so that they increasingly focus on their education courses. So about uh, our students uh, take approximately a third of their courses outside of the College of Education and Social Services. And we believe this really contributes to them being well-rounded students, as well as students who develop expertise in particular content areas, which of course is really important for our secondary ed students. All of our licensure programs include um, multiple practicum opportunities, so shorter term experiences in schools, as well as um, an intensive semester long, so that's 13 weeks, uh, 
uh, student teaching experience in, in a school. Um, some of those schools are here near us in Burlington and Winooski and surrounding communities. And then we have students placed out in, in areas such as uh, Mount Abraham, the Bristol area, Waterbury, and, and further beyond uh, that. And we're very proud of our relationships with our school partners. We, we've hired over the past few years someone whose sole uh, role is to develop those partnerships and really take a look at our placements and make sure they're very high quality. Uh, so our students, in order to become licensed, they, they complete all the course and internship requirements that I've just described. Additionally, they need to pass the Vermont licensure portfolio, which I'm sure you're well aware of, uh, and demonstrate satisfactory performance on measures such as the Praxis or the Praxis Core. We do have a rather significant number of students who come from out of state. So that's just an important thing to remember about our programs. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of our um, students are out of state students. That's a lower level than the university as a whole. Um, but that, that's important for us because we do need to pay attention also to other standardized assessments that they may need to take in other states. So we're, we're attentive to that and have a director of teacher licensure who helps with that, keeping track of all of that. So on to a little bit more about literacy and how that works, how we're preparing our teachers to engage uh, PK through 12 students in all forms of literacy. Um, once students have taken the core courses I described earlier, they do begin to specialize according to the grade or age level that they're working with. So of course, our students in early education will learn different techniques and strategies around literacy than those who are secondary ed students. But I think across all of those programs, uh, we emphasize the use of evidence-based programs. We pay a lot of attention to ensuring that our students can differentiate between what constitutes an evidence-based program or intervention as compared to a program that may not have a robust research base. Professor um, Shepard, I, I just want to interrupt for a moment. Senator Gulick uh, has a question. Sure. Hi, yeah, thank you for taking my question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask about literacy. I was mm -hmm. on the um, Vermont Literacy Advisory Council, and we've been talking a lot about literacy in here, and I know the House is also talking about literacy. Um, and I know I'm bringing up a potential can of worms, but um, there seems to be a general sense that whole language instruction hasn't been super successful. And when you look at our literacy scores, they're not great. Um, and one of the things we heard over and over again from teachers is, I haven't been trained in how to teach phonics. I don't know how to teach phonics. And we know that that is a method that is, um, as you said, evidence-based and um, seems to be quite successful. I'm wondering if at the college level, in terms of teacher training, is there more training now or will there be uh, around phonics instruction? I would answer yes to both of your questions. I believe there is more now and it is something we're looking at. And, um, you know, Dr. Van Esten and I are both, as I said, special educators by training, which means as part of our training, we both are well-versed in uh, phonetically based and structured language approaches to teaching literacy. So that's something that's very much on our minds. And where I was heading with the different levels, I would say it is the case currently that our students in early education and elementary education are getting probably a larger dose of that of those approaches to reading than we are could guarantee for our middle and secondary level students. Partly that's because of the reading demands that are are in front of kids depending on what age level they're at. So obviously, uh, early reading, foundational literacy, those phonetics-based approaches are going to be more critical at the early education and elementary school level. But that said, we certainly know that not all students acquire those skills. And so we are very much focused on, particularly our students who are identified, pre-K through 12 students who identify as having a disability, um, we're very much attuned to preparing our 
our, our teachers to, to address those needs. So I would say what's, what is true at, the, at this time is that our students who also specialize in special education um, will get more content area around uh, structured language and literacy programs, including phonics-based instruction, um, whereas our students it, at the secondary level are tending to engage with literacy approaches that are more discipline focused. Um, so we are introducing, I would say, everyone to a, a broad set of um, skills and understandings of different approaches to teaching reading, but we are not, we, we could probably find some differences across grade levels in how those play out. I want to well, mention- thank you. thank you, and I just wanted to, um reiterate, um, and I, I know you know this, but it's it seems like it's it's true that um, reading um, phonics instruction should not be limited to students who have special education needs and should be available to all students because we know that not all students will learn in the whole language model. So I just just want to make that yes. plug. Thank you so much. No, I appreciate that point and I and I Agree, and uh, and I think you know we we are concerned about the gaps that we see in performance in our Vermont students and nationally, and we're you know especially concerned because those gaps tend to differentially affect students with disabilities, students who experience poverty, and and to some extent multilingual students. So we we are very concerned about this, and I think we're we're interested in engaging in this conversation. And we've been we've had a few conversations, not lots yet, but we are aware of the uh, bill that's being prepared at the House level. So I'll just say a couple more things maybe about literacy. So your, your point is very well taken. I think it's also important to say that um, we do think about not so much whole language, but a holistic approach to literacy. So we are thinking about, for example, our multilingual learners may need some different strategies than students who whose first language is English. Uh, we are we also do talk a lot with our students about the ways in which uh, socioeconomic status, culture, language play into literacy development for all students. Um, and, and to some degree, sometimes that means those students have assets that, um, for example, multilingual students have some assets that single language students don't have. Uh, but we are, we are asking our students to think about how a student's background and culture and home life also affects their, their literacy uh, approaches, skills, and acquisition levels. Um, and again, as students, as our students go up into the upper levels, middle and secondary levels, in addition to literacy and making sure that all students can actually read at the word and sentence and paragraph level and so on, we are also talking about approaches that emphasize motivation, executive functioning, um, and again, these critical and sociocultural views of reading. So um, I think that is important to 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 know. And and yes, I agree with you that you have to learn. You have to be able to access any kind of text in order to become a very critical reader or a reader who can comprehend very complex text. Um, and uh, one last word on sorry. Missed one point of my points. Uh, one last word on our multilingual learners. We do ensure that our students who pursue our um, minor in cultural and linguistic diversity uh, take a course in reading and writing that emphasizes the, the WIDA standards that, uh, that apply to those multilingual learners. So I think, again, I just want to emphasize that we, we are attuned to, increasingly so, really making sure that all of our teacher education candidates as well as our leadership candidates you know ha are, are have a deep knowledge of what evidence-based approaches mean how how something is deemed to be an evidence-based approach and to some degree um how how our new teachers can learn how to approach perhaps a teacher in a, a classroom or a school-wide approach that doesn't appear to have a good evidence base. So one, th one thing that I think we all need to think about with you all is there are many things we do at the pre-service level or when students come back to us for graduate education. But as you mentioned, I think in your opening statement, uh, we've also got to think about what's going on in our schools and how we bring, bring professional development 
to, uh, to current teachers, which in turn helps our new teachers uh, practice in the very best ways possible. Um, and we do, you know, along those lines, a, another piece we are try to expose our students to and, and have them placed in, in schools where this is prevalent. We're interested in having students understand Vermont's practice of the use of multi-systems, uh, multi-tiered systems of support and have them understand how if you've got a student who's struggling to read in your classroom, uh, and the, you know, what, who are the people that can help you? What kinds of interventions are helpful? How do those interventions get delivered? Let's say for an older student who still needs uh, a more direct or explicit, explicit instructional approach. So I think I'm getting close to the end of what I wanted to say, but I do, I, I do think it's important for you to know that we, we are concerned about teacher shortages. Uh, one of the things, and, and Kimber can talk more about this, we have been partnering with the Agency of Education, with the state colleges, and with some of our uh, local administrators around the teacher shortage issue in, in Vermont, particularly around special education teacher shortages. And one example of that is we, um, Vermont has become a technical assistance site for a federally funded project called CEDAR, C-E-E-D-A-R. I won't be able to give you the full acronym, but it's Collaborative and Effective Teacher Education. Uh, and But that technical assistance project has brought us some resources, has brought us to the table with our partners in the state system. And I think that's been a really exciting opportunity. Um, and, and the Vermont Higher Education Collaborative is included in that as well. And so we are trying to be creative in thinking about how we can address teacher shortages, uh, provide necessary coursework for teachers who may be on provisional licenses, um, and do that in a way that, you know, makes it possible for those who, who are interested in becoming teachers in Vermont to do so efficiently without sacrificing quality. Uh, so so we are that's another sort of area that we are paying attention to. It's not the university's responsibility, like it isn't Middlebury's or Bennington's or St. Mike's, but I, I am curious how much is the university in our public schools? You know, I, I mean, I, I love, we see in Boston and other cities sometimes universities are really in our schools. And I understand that you're in, in the schools by educating our, our teachers, et cetera. But it could be argued, I'm not making the argument, but you know, any school around the University of Vermont, this you know, incredible institution of higher education should be top notch because of the access, the, the, uh, the standards, the access, the, the rigor, just you know, the, the power, if you will, of the university, you know, the, the ability to, to educate people. Yeah, I'm not being as articulate as I'd like to be, but I think you get a sense of what I'm yeah. trying to get at in the United, it'd be like, you know, what's the elementary school next to Harvard University? If it's not doing well, I think we should ask Harvard to get a little bit more involved. I couldn't agree more. And I'll let Kimber answer part of this question. I'll just start us off by saying, um, absolutely. We're, we're, we're obviously quite deeply engaged with the schools where we have student teachers who are placed uh, in those settings. We also have a number of engaged research projects that are in our local schools as well as in some of our rural schools. But we have many opportunities to expand uh, those partnerships. And one of the things I think is really exciting about where UVM is as an institution is I think our current administration has really emphasized our land grant mission and as challenging all of the deans, frankly, not, not just me, but all of the deans to think about what are the partnerships we creating outside of Chittenden County in particular. And so you've probably seen news of the new Institute for Rural Partnerships that's been established at the university. This will offer us some, some new ways and some new resources uh, that I believe will help us do a better job of partnering with our, our, our schools across the state. I also think that um, as, as a new dean, I'm very interested in thinking about how we can partner with UVM's 11 extension offices because again, we, we are in some parts of the state, but we're not, 
we're not as ubiquitous as we should be. So I do believe there are lots of opportunities and I, I couldn't agree more. It's core to the university's mission. And, you know, what we do as a college to me is, is one of the most important things that goes on. So we, we, we need to continue to um, ensure that we are out and about and doing really meaningful work and partnering with our, our school districts and communities. Kimber, I, I know I left out many examples. What, what would you like to add to that? Uh, well, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Kimber Van Est, Chair of the Department of Education, and really appreciate your time and your invitation. I, I agree that it, it is our responsibility. Um, so I don't, I think it's okay to, to throw that out there. So we do, um, we do a number of outreach activities to fulfill that responsibility beyond all of our hundreds of hours of practicum experiences and the student teaching. So we routinely reach out to principals and superintendents and ask them what, what they need from us and how we could do better with our educator preparation program. We host administrators and educators to come on campus and talk to us about what's going on in the schools and what they think um, we could do better to meet their needs. We have had some really fruitful conversations about starting grow your own programs or starting residency internship types of programs where our students might be even ex have access to homestays in rural communities to be able to be more integrated. And we have also reached out to a number of schools and districts offering additional professional development around topic areas that they might be struggling with given the educator shortage. We also try to be responsive to those things. So it's one thing to be have a responsibility to be there. And it's uh, another thing yet again, to do something about what we learn from being there. And we have changed some of our programming as a result of the information that we get back from our community partners. So we, we very much agree and want to be a service to, to the area and the state in that way. I see it as central to the mission. Absolutely. And I'll just add, you've probably heard of, um, it was recently renamed or in the last few years, but UVM's uh, professional and continuing education area, which used to be called continuing and distance education. And we have um, been working to, to think about ways we can use PACE, uh, the shorthand, as, as an arm of our college to, again, reach in-place teachers or teachers who need retooling or people who want to enter the teaching field after they've done other things. So we're currently launching uh, or, or preparing to transition our master's program in special education to, in, within a couple of years, a fully online program to help extend our reach. So um, we, we do take those roles very seriously. And I think it, it's absolutely critical to the, to the university's place in this state. And growth and development. We've, in relationship to literacy, we've moved our program that is a literacy specialist coaching um, program to meet the needs of the state. We've moved that to be online, so it has greater accessibility to more people. Professor, more professor, could you speak a little bit, maybe get a little closer to your computer? We don't hear you quite as well as we hear Professor Shepard. Sure. How is this? Testing one, two. It's a little better. A little better? <laughs> It's better. It's I think better. I've got my mic all the way up. How about now? Okay, it's better. Good. All right. We have uh, also moved our literacy coaching, literacy specialist program for that coursework to be online so that it's more accessible to greater numbers of individuals in the state who may not be within driving distance. That's another example, I think, of how important this is to us. Uh, when do teachers, teacher candidates enter the classroom generally? They generally enter the classroom in their freshman or sophomore year, depending right. on if they're a first time, first year student coming in brand new, or if they are a transfer student. So we have an early and often model that we Great. use. Great. Committee, other questions, please, Senator Weeks. So curiosity question, uh, I, I know that your prime focus is undergraduate and graduate uh, level education. 
Uh, but you both mentioned professional development, and I'm wondering kind of what you know how you how you view your role in professional development, and and how uh, how um, uh, immersed you are in the state schools on providing professional development that may be necessary to maintain licenses or what have you. Yeah, it's a great question. I think we're we're quite engaged from the standpoint that we do have, you know, many of the students who graduate from our graduate programs or certificate programs are, are coming back to, to refresh their knowledge or to gain new skills. So we're certainly engaged that way. We, as I mentioned, we're looking for new opportunities to the professional and continuing education area of the university. I think this is another growth area for us though, quite frankly. And, you know, I don't want to use the pandemic as an excuse, but it's certainly uh, the pandemic was a time when we had to sort of shrink back inwards and make sure we could get everyone in our programs through uh, under unusual circumstances. So we, we find ourselves now turning back outward and looking for more opportunities. So again, I think this is something we look forward to building out and, and would look forward to partnering with some others. Uh, sometimes it's a challenge for us because our full-time faculty who are engaged with our degree programs are pretty busy folks, but uh, I think we certainly have many contacts in the field um, that we can partner with to provide uh, increasingly robust professional development opportunities. I would add generally that the <clears throat> professional development um, connection comes from the field to us more often than vice versa. So although we push out and do some offerings, generally it's school sites themselves that say, we would like additional professional development in X, Y, or Z, math methods, reading, behavior management. And I think we're very open to providing that individually through faculty or through a, through a department. And I'll just add one other thing, which I failed to mention earlier, because it's not really quite as specific to teacher licensure, but we have, our, we have a couple of outreach centers, one focused on uh, social work practices in the division of children and families, but our, um, our area that focuses on uh, community, uh, sorry, disability and community inclusion, the CDCI, uh, that center provides a lot of direct outreach to schools through the I-team, which the state funds. Uh, that's a team that services uh, students with more significant disabilities. And so there's a certain level of more targeted interventions and outreach that we do through those those couple of service and outreach areas. As well as some institutes and then our research teams, our, our mm -hmm. faculty and tenure and tenure track lines and lectures and senior lecturers are often engaged in research in the schools and intervention work or training on new methods and new practices often involves professional development through that, through their uh, work to get grants from the federal government to provide services to schools. This has been incredibly helpful. We very much appreciate it. I'm looking around to see if there are any additional questions. Uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation. If you find yourselves in Montpelier, please let us know. We'd love to see you yes. in person. And if we see ourselves, uh, find ourselves at the University of Vermont, we will certainly be in contact. But if anything comes up, in your work over the next you know, several months. Please let us know if we can be helpful. We're about to shift now to understand what we're doing for those teachers who may be graduating with debt. You know, what can we do to help them? Uh, we're talking about this in the context of a Teach in Vermont campaign. Uh, and so uh, we appreciate your partnership in, in any way, shape, and form. So thank you both for everything you're, you do for, for Vermont uh, and for the UVM students. We really, it, it doesn't go unnoticed. Please. Thank yeah. you. Well, and, and thank you so much. And, and to your last point, yes, count us in. We want to be part of that discussion. We absolutely believe that, um, you know, the teaching profession in this country has got to make it easier for teachers to to get an education, a, a high quality education, and not to end up with lots of debt, only to go into a profession that we don't yet pay people as much as they should be paid to do. So we're, we're behind you on that one for sure. And really eager to talk to you in the future. And we will come to Montpelier. We both had rather 
<laughs> full schedules today and couldn't manage them. Oh no, no, that wasn't that wasn't a, a you know. No, don't get me wrong, I get digs sometimes. That wasn't a dig, I promise. Yeah, we. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We'd love to see you either on Zoom or, or in person. Thank you. Excellent. Thank Thanks you both so very much. Okay. Thank you. Right. Have to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cargo. You're our. Uh, What's the expression? Your are batting clean up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I know you have a presentation. Uh, so I wasn't even going to present. I yeah, to please, provide just, you with my the talking points I'm going to speak from. Um, thinking kind of broadly to a bigger question, how do you reduce the debt that students have, uh, especially for these teaching teachers that you're interested in? And I think the first thing you do when you're trying to reduce debt is you're trying to provide enough non-debt financial aid that yeah. you don't have to take out loans. So that's yeah. kind of the starting point. But when you're thinking about, oh, sorry, Marilyn Cargill, the Mont <laughs> Student Assistance Corporation. You're so famous, you don't even need to. You know, it's I like know better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to all of you. Um, so you've got your grant programs, your scholarship programs, yeah. and you've got your forgivable loan programs. Mm -hmm. Those are all what I would consider access programs. That's what gets students who are thinking about going to college into school. Yeah. And certainly, you know, uh, Senator Campion, that the legislature for the last few years has put a lot of emphasis on those forgivable loan programs. The way a forgivable loan program works is that you are making an obligation to work in a specific field within the state of Vermont for a specific amount of time in exchange for an amount of money that, that acts as a scholarship if you fulfill the work obligation and becomes a loan if you do not. Mm -hmm. Those programs, um, and I'm gonna show you on the next slide, we've got a number of those going right now. Those programs can work really well for that student that knows exactly what they're going to do. So we find, um, for example, that 85% of our nursing students who use forgivable loans repay them with work obligation. That's exactly what we're looking for. There's always some percent that end up moving out of state or doing something different uh, and don't use, don't repay them with work obligation. And then there's some who are in the wrong major. Mm -hmm. And they may take one of these forgivable loans mm -hmm. and realize this is not the right path for them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions I have asked, if I had had a chance, and I knew this was not my opportunity to ask questions, but I may reach out to your... your always, if you are sitting there, please know if there's something, yeah. But I'm curious how many students start in education as a major and change their majors? Hmm. Because that's when forgivable loans become, dangerous is way too big of a word, but they become more difficult because if you take a full tuition forgivable loan for eighteen or $20,000, and then you also are given your federal Stafford loans, your direct loans, that student's got an awful lot of debt mm -hmm. that they're carrying. And if they're doing that for four years and then make a different decision, they're in way worse a position than they would have been without that forgivable loan, just from how much debt are they now carrying. So sometimes the way that you can um, adjust for that is Perhaps forgivable loans come in in their juniors and senior years when they've had an opportunity. I loved their comments about we use a um, frequent in the classroom, start early and do it yeah, frequently. I, love yeah. I loved that to hear that because I think you know sooner whether maybe you're on the right path or the wrong path right. for you. Um, but some states do hold off. We don't on any of the programs we have in Vermont right now, but in some states, um, they do hold off on awarding them until later in the program, which reduces overall debt, but it doesn't necessarily increase the number of people in the pipeline that are going to become teachers. So there's a 
you know, there's a yin and a yang to, to those options. Grants and scholarships are the easiest way for students, but if they don't lock them into that work obligation, which I think, again, the legislature has been really, has found really attractive as a way to increase our workforce. What if we started a fund, a public-private partnership where the legislature and some private industry had a fund that was either an opportunity fund for teachers or a way to actually, let's say you've been teaching a couple of years, but put some guidelines around it to start to reduce some of that debt. I mean, it's just, it's such a big deal. We're not talking about people that are gonna be able to leave and make a ton of money, you know? At any stage, really, this is the career that they want. Absolutely. So. The other program I just wanted to mention that VSAC is administering, it was created last year in the legislature, yeah. and we co-work uh, on this with the UVM Office of Engagement, and that is a loan repayment program. And what this one is, this is about right. actually recruiting right. teachers and keeping your grads in Vermont. And the way that program works, and it's, it's, we're standing it up right now, it'll be students will be able to apply for it this coming spring as they graduate, is if someone chooses to work in Vermont in a field that we've identified, the current one is not that, but you certainly could do it for teaching, and they live and work in Vermont, that you're willing to forgive or pay back a certain percent of their loan. It could be a percent, it could be a solid dollar amount. The UVM program that we're just standing up is going to pay $5,000 of student loan debt in a, for a two-year commitment to living and working in Vermont. It doesn't matter what the field is, but the field must require a bachelor's degree. So you have to graduate this spring from a Vermont college. You must be getting a job that requires the degree, not necessarily the one you've got, because as we all know, I'm a biology major and you know, I, have, I needed a degree to get the job, but I didn't need to be a biology major to do it. Um, but you have to have at least a job that requires a degree. So that's another tool that potentially you use. One is going to attract people who are already teachers, and the grants and scholarships and loan forgiveness is really about encouraging more students to go into their educational career path of education. One is teachers that are already trained, and one is for years from now, the first teacher would step out type of thing. They would get, do their four-year degree. Didn't, didn't we have a program like that, but it was for come come to Vermont, move here, and work here, and we'll pay, what, $10,000? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, there's a, is that still, did that sunset? That's a great question. Because uh, it's kind of like what you're talking, except you've added education. I'll ask Senator Ron Hensel. Do you know the answer? I don't know the answer, but I mean, I was just going to comment that I think that program, but making it a bit more specific and saying, yeah. here's 10 grand if you're in one of these professions, you know, one of these five or six professions that are sorely needed, and you can have this 10 grand if you stay here for a couple of years, or making it incremental where, you know, they're here for two years, they get two grand, they're here for another two years, they get another two grand yeah. of that 10K. Uh, that way you can avoid people coming in for six months, getting their 10 grand and being like, all right, going to New York. Yeah, yeah, much more strategic. It was, it was 10 grand, five, five grand a year. Five grand a year? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what they got. That's right. That's right. So, and, but it would take a marketing yeah. dimension to it. We're going to be attracted to the state. Think. Yeah. Yeah. So, the very next um, slide I have just shows you the workforce development funding that we're currently running out of GSAC. Um, and what I wanted you to see was the interest free, forgivable loans that are currently set up. So, there's one for early childhood education, nursing, the trades. The Vermont National Guard has one that's not specific to their major it is specific to them working in the guard um, and then there is one for the Vermont dentist and there's also one for primary care physicians and that one you do have to be a junior or a senior at the UVM College of Medicine and you're agreeing 
and this is a long ways out, but when you finish school and your residency, that you will return to work in Vermont. Could you provide us, and it kind of looks like it's on page four, but I'm not just what the teachers are doing. Could you just send us a document, if you're a teacher, what the opportunities are for you to sort of come back? Yeah, it absolutely is. So if you skip over to page, if you look at page five right now, okay. you have full-time and part-time Vermont State grants through VSAC that you can okay. apply for. Yep. If but I need to know the scratch. You want to know the dollar I want to know the dollars. Because, so, yeah. the, the dollars of full-time and part-time, first of all, all of the programs that we run for the state of Vermont are need-based programs, so families yeah. have to show financial need. Um, but a, a grant at UVM would range between $1,000 for a middle, upper middle income family to as much as seven thousand dollars for a low-income family. The um, private scholarships that we run, as you know, those are coming from foundations. We talked about this when I was here a little while ago. Endowments, the state has some. Uh, there's seven that specifically are for education, but again, I will just say the majority of those programs. I shouldn't say the majority. At least half of those are for our early childhood educators. There's such a focus last year mm -hmm. on creating funding for early childhood education. And then the only forgivable loan that we're currently running for education is also for early childhood education. Could you just run for us, no rush, maybe get next week, the teacher, the middle to low income Vermonter that graduates from uh, UVM or the state colleges, the, the real possibility of what he or she may be able to get, and then on the other side, the early childhood educators. Just so we can see, hey, they're going to max, somebody could get up to 20,000, or is the max 1,700? You know, just so I can really get my head around these numbers. Sure. That would be great. Um, because when we talk to a pros, you know, I, it'll be helpful to see if we really do need something else. And, and, and in that, how much money are we realistically giving out? Is it one kid every year is going to get a $25,000 and then he or she stays around? Or really, are we really reaching 100 teachers, you know, potential teachers every year? So that's what I'm trying to talk to Senator Kitchell about, and that would be helpful if I could get that. Sure. The other thing we can do, Senator Campion, if you would like us to, um, and we did this with the nursing, was um, we kind of looked at amounts of money. If it was a million dollars and you wanted to pay full tuition up to UVM's tuition, how many students can you have? If you're trying to do UVM and the state colleges, are we trying to do every college in Vermont? Because as you know, when we get into the private schools, whether we would pay full tuition or we cap it at what we would pay at UVM, for example, that's something that we do with some of these other forgivable loans. So if you as a committee yeah, have yeah. some thoughts yeah. on what you'd like to do or how you might like to structure something, then we can model that for you and tell you roughly what would happen there. Okay. But this would be a great start just to, yeah, for absolutely. Us to we'll get work those numbers first. around. Yeah, yeah, then we can go from there. Questions? Just a small comment that I support the idea of trying to make this a bit more robust uh, to apply to more people and keep uh, people in the state. Oh, yeah. Priority of mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Me too. I also think there could be something out there from private industry, I'll be yeah. honest. You know, I really do. I think everybody has kids, in, a lot of people have kids in the school. I have a six-year-old beagle, but most people have kids in the school. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you are welcome. Really appreciate it. Yeah, that was great. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming in. Oh, you are so welcome. Always and as always, my contact information is on that last page. Yeah. If you have questions, please reach out to us. And I'll have Hayden send you an email about next week, either just zooming in and just walking us through what some of these numbers really look like. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay, we're adjourned.